All right, all right. Thanks for joining me on this episode of the Gospel Truth. I'm your host, Marlon Wilson, and we have another great debate for you today. And it seems like it's been a long time since the last time I have been in front of you. And I think it's been like two weeks, and that's a little too long. And so I uh, thank you for sticking out with me. I know that you guys have been looking forward to these debates. And today uh, we have a two versus two, a 202 debate. And I love 202 debates. Uh, one thing about 202 debates is that they uh, uh, are demanding. Uh, and because you have to do, have organization, team organization, and you're relying on your other partner to do a great job so you can come in and back them up. So I love 202 debates. But before we bring this, these guys in, and before we get this debate going, I do want to go ahead and encourage you to make sure you subscribe. Make sure you hit that like, subscribe, and a notification bell for the gospel truth man if you can't support the ministry what a subscribe hey what else you gonna do man you can at least do that for me make sure you hit the subscribe button uh, if you are not aware we do have all this content on podcast itunes google play stitcher and spotify so make sure that you are viewing in on the podcast well you don't view in you actually listen but you know what i mean make sure you hit that that subscribe button on a podcast if you also if you're not aware all this content is not only on youtube well the video content is on youtube but we are also found on facebook instagram and twitter so make sure you are flowing on those other platforms to stay in tune with what the god's truth has going on all right now that said we do have a bunch of debates coming up here going on coming up in the future so i do want you to be aware of them all right coming up uh does the gospel of matthew teach that jesus is god now this is going to be a two-part debate so these guys you see on that little banner down below those guys are going to be with me two weeks in a row uh start next week uh we got mohammed and a guy that called himself king servant and we're going to be doing the whole gospel of matthew this is part one and then the next slide you see is part two so this is a two-part debate that's going to be going down over the next two weeks so make sure you are staying in and subscribing so you don't missed that one and then after that i have is the sabbath keeping necessary in order to inherit the kingdom of god these guys have debated before on this platform together and they decide to jump back into the ring again for so well, you never know a rematch you know um a rematch of sorts so i got ricky caldwell and stanley terry and they're gonna duke it out once again in the theological octagon for this debate so make sure that you are tuning in and then after that have unbelievers been crucified and raised in christ and we got David Wilson, who's been on before, and I have Matt Nickel. Uh, I think I said Nickel. Uh, so it's going to be a great one. So make sure that you are jumping on the gospel truth because you don't want to miss out on any debates, man. I would hate for you to miss out on them. And the best way you can stay engaged with what we got going on is to hit the subscribe button. All right. Also, I have an announcement. Uh, we are signed up for another live in-person debate. Uh, we got Daniel Constantino, and he's going to be uh, debating Luke Lucas. I believe Luke. I believe I can't, I know, I can't remember name. I'm terrible with names, so forgive me. But Lucas, and we're going to be deb debating that. And that's going to be done in Arizona at Apologia Church. So, um, if you're in town in Phoenix, Arizona, during uh, around the time of September 24th, uh, I want you to come on by and check out a live debate live in person debate i'll be there moderating and uh we'll have a great debate it's going to be concerning perseverance of the saints and conditional uh, security uh, so it's going to be a great debate so make sure that you are if you're in that area in that town around september 24th make sure you come by and say hi all right all right that said i have uh, my debaters here and so i have luther menard and doc i call him doctor father jonathan evanoff so I have these guys. They're going to be representing the Orthodox Church position concerning this debate. And if you remember Luther, uh, last time Luther was on, he debated Merrick Kaiser. Um, and that was a fun debate. And, you know, two young guys jumping into the ring. Battling out, man, that was a fun debate to watch, man, because a lot of times you don't see a lot of young cats jumping in these kind of discussions, right? You don't see it a lot. So when you do get the young guys that jump in, they're very entertaining and it's very, uh, I don't know if encouraging is the word I should use, but it's very, yeah, I think it is very encouraging to see young guys being able to debate it out in a fashion that they did. And so, uh, he, that was the last time, you know, Jonathan, uh, uh, Father Jonathan has, this is first go around on the gospel truth. And I'm looking forward to see what he got, man. Cause you know, you know, while, while these guys are debating, you know, I'm in the background and I am like 
taking notes, you know, I'm taking mental notes, saying, oh yeah, he know what he's doing, man. So he may be a good debater, uh, may connect with him later on. So yeah, so I'm looking forward to see what these guys got, man. They jumping in and I'm glad they have joined me to represent the Orthodox position. And also I have Cameron Brinkman and Tony Nash. This is Tony Nash first time go around, man. So you guys be nice to him, but uh, he's, uh, he's partnered up with Cameron and Cameron's been on before. He teamed up with Merrick Kaiser, uh, the same person that Luther debated and they debated uh, two Unitarians, uh, Brandon Duke and Andrew Davis. And so uh, that was a fun debate as well. Very encouraging debate. And um, I'm excited. And so we're going to jump into this. I've I done my little pre-introduction. So I'm going to bring these guys in so they can introduce themselves to you guys. What's up, fellas? How y'all doing? What's going on? Hey, Marlon. Good stuff. I'm glad you guys have joined me, man. It's uh, This is a long-awaited debate, man. We planned this out about a couple months ago, and so I am glad to have you guys on, and this subject matter is a serious subject matter. This is one not to play games with, man. Solar Scriptura. And so we're going to have fun with this, man, and these are always fun, exciting debates, and I look forward to hearing what you guys have to say. But before we get into the debate, I'm going to allow you guys to introduce yourselves to the audience, tell them what you do blogs whatever it is tell them what you do so they can connect with you and perhaps come subscribe to your to your content all right so start with the orthodox team mr luther menard and father jonathan evanoff if you guys don't mind go ahead and give a quick introduction to yourself all right uh father am i going or are you going yeah you go first go ahead okay okay all right, uh, my name's Luther. Uh, or I'm Orthodox Christian. Uh, I got no nothing to promote here, um, but yeah, Orthodox Christian. Love my family, and you know that's pretty much it. I'm Father Jonathan Ivanov. Uh, I've been a priest in the Orthodox Church for over 29 years now, over 30 years in ordained ministry, including my time in the diaconate. All that time as a priest, I've been at the same church out here on Long Island, uh, a church called St. John the Theologian Orthodox Church in a, in a town called Shirley, uh, which is out toward the east end of Long Island. I'm married, uh, happily married for 35 years. Got two children, a son who's 34 and a daughter who's going to be 29 in October. And um, my, my faith, my church uh, mean everything to me. Uh, it's wonderful to be able to come on a program like this. Thank you very much, Marlon, uh, where we can, in a, in a, in a calm, rational, uh, a friendly way, you might say, I guess, talk about these different topics and uh, see where we are with all of them. So I'm grateful to Marlon and I'm grateful to Cam and to Tony for uh, taking us on. And I look forward to tonight. Thank you all who are watching this for joining the conversation. All right, guys. Thank you guys once again for coming on. All right, Cameron and Tony, uh, I want you guys go ahead and give a quick introduction to yourself. Tell them what you do. Tell them where you, where you at, man. Uh, I'm Tony Nash. Uh, I'm an LCMS Lutheran. Um, just representing myself. I mean, I'm, I've am i done some stuff with Lutheran Scholastics, which Cameron will mention, but uh, great channel. Um, put out really good content promoting, uh, you know, Scholasticism, um, which has been uh, did I lose Tony? Uh oh, look, I lost Tony. All right, Cameron, uh, if you can go ahead and give a quick introduction to yourself, man, while we try to tackle what uh, what happened with Tony. Are you are you muted, Cameron? Sorry, muted myself. Yeah, my, my name is Cameron. Uh, like Tony said, I'm involved in Lutheran Scholastics. Uh, Lutheran Scholastics is a YouTube channel that focuses on, you guessed it, Lutheran Scholasticism. And it seeks to uh, interact with patristic sources, uh, medieval sources, and a wide variety of, uh, you know, uh, entities in the Christian tradition. And, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why we uh, agreed to do this debate, which, uh, you know, the Eastern Orthodox tradition is one of the, uh, you know, foremost traditions in Christendom and has a wide intellectual tradition. And uh, yeah, we, we look forward to hearing what our opponents have to say. They've been cordial throughout. And uh, yeah, I, I think they're able, you know, 
uh, defenders of their position. And uh, I will, uh, you know, pray and hope that, you know, uh, everyone who's listening, uh, you know, can can learn. And I hope I can learn. You know, I think both of us, me and Tony, can both say that. All right. Uh, Tony, did you have anything to add before we lost you? Yeah, I'm sorry. My computer froze. Uh, I have a dinosaur laptop. But uh, no, I'm I'm just a humble LCMS Lutheran. Just happy to be here. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, Marlon, you have a wonderful channel. And thank you uh, to Luther and uh, Father, Father Jonathan for having this discussion. And I think it's going to be a good time. All right, guys. Good stuff. I appreciate you guys, man. I appreciate the compliments of the platform, and I'm glad you guys jumped on, man. So we ain't gonna waste any more time, man. We are gonna jump into this. Once again, the topic of today's debate is Sola Scriptura or Orthodox Church, or which one is the true rule of faith. Um, and so we're gonna be uh, jumping off with 15 minute opening statements. Both teams will have first personal team will have seven minutes each, seven and a half minutes each to go through their opening statement, and we're gonna follow that with seven minute rebuttals, and then we're gonna have. 40 minute cross examination both parties will get 20 minutes each to lead with questions and then we're going to have seven minute closings and there's some q a from the audience sounds good yep sounds good all right so i don't think we discussed who we're going to go first because this is not a negative affirmative type of uh premise so um anybody want to raise their hand we, so you uh, go we just chatted Okay, you guys yeah, are going to go first. Uh... Oh, sorry. Solo Scriptura uh, I guess... is going to go first. Oh, Solo, <laughs> I mean, okay. Really... All right, all right. I'm trying to... <laughs> <laughs> Try to make sure I shoot. Right, make sure you put me on the game. I should know this stuff, man, but you guys put me on the game. Yeah. Anyway, all right. All right, so Sola Scriptura, you guys are going to go first, man. And uh, once again, when you get to your one-minute mark, you'll hear this little chime. And that'll let you know to start wrapping it up, all right? So, uh, okay. So you want to let me get you up here to get your presentation. And hold on, camera. Let me pull you up there as well. All right, camera, you got it, man. Uh, and I'll start the time when you begin to speak. And uh, we think this debate uh, hopefully will uh, edify you as much as our interactions with them have edified us. So in tonight's debate, we will be defending the Sola Scriptura position. The primary contention of Sola Scriptura is that the word of God, that is the propositional content and inspired sense of the scriptures, is the sole infallible role of faith and practice in the church today, ordained by God through the apostolate to be a clear and perspicuous guide for God's people in all ages. By implication, we argue Sola Scriptura is the rationally warranted a default position of the church Catholic. There is no infallible revealed dogmatic content uh, absolutely binding the conscience of the faithful, not explicitly contained in the scriptures or based on legitimate consequences from their end. That does not mean bits and pieces of reason, experience, and tradition will not be infallible in a specified sense. We only maintain that these enterprises, taken collectively, are not infallible in the same way, that is, simpliciter and without reservation, that the proclamations and councils of sacred writ are. Put another way, reason, experience, and tradition are ministers to interpreting the text, not magistrates over the text. Since both parties in this debate agree on the insufficiency of reason and experience to lead us to eternal life, we will focus on tradition. Is the correct role of faith the teachings of the Orthodox Church, summed up in scripture and tradition, or sola scriptura? Well, to answer the question, we will first have to define the word tradition. Taken in its most basic sense, tradition means anything handed down, either by word of mouth or sacred writ. So we will need to specify further, using a helpful list provided in the second generation reformer Martin Chemnitz's examination of the Council of Trent. He lists eight types of traditions, but we will focus on six for debate purposes. This will also serve as a springboard for laying out the Lutheran conception of Sola Scriptura, what it is and is not. So the first tradition Chemnitz mentions is an infallible one, since an infallible apostolate delivers it. Indeed, the preached word only differs accidentally from the written scriptures. Properly speaking, the word of God is, as the Puritan John Ball puts it, the will of God revealed on demand, being a reasonable creature, 
teaching them what to do, believe, and left undone. In this respect, the divine logos is intimately connected to the preached and written logos. The preached word is accidentally distinct from the scriptures, but substantially identical to it. The scriptures postdate the church in the accidental sense, but predate it in the substantial sense, for the church would never exist without her word. The second set of traditions Chemnitz mentions are fallible canonical traditions, ones worthy of our praise. While the church has often been unclear on which books are canonical and which are not, we admit that the fathers had open and honest debates about canonicity. More importantly, they protected that which was sacred. Here's how the local or visible church relates to the canon. The church is the ministerial cause, the entity which delivers us the scriptures as she receives them from, receives them from the apostles and prophets. The church is the protectorate cause, that which receives and protects the scriptures as her prized jewel. Lastly, the church is an instrumental cause. God uses her preaching to seal faith, hope, and love in the justified. Nevertheless, we believe the scriptures in a supernatural way, not for the sake of the church, for that would only produce probable certainty, but because of the scriptures themselves, for their majesty and efficacy show forth on every page, with the Holy Spirit testifying and witnessing to their grandeur. From there, the scriptures become the principium and canon of our faith, known from themselves and authoritative of their own right. We likewise infer the canonization process is not dogmatic. The canon is not an article of faith. The inspired authors do not beget new articles of faith solely by writing a new book, especially if that book contained that which they early, earlier uh, delivered audibly to their hearers. Instead, the word of God is the ground and source of all dogma. So with that said, the third set of traditions are helpful ministerial guides to the text. Nevertheless, since the fathers disagree amongst themselves, their consent is fallible. We grant and readily acknowledge the fathers have probable authority in churchly matters. Yet their authority does not approach the metaphysical certainty of the clear and express words of sacred writ. As John Dowley argues, the fathers are something of the Aristotle's of divinity. However, such authority does not equal prophetic status. If you want to claim the consensus of the fathers is infallible, you would need to provide sufficiently early testimony to justify the apostolicity of that conclusion. But the earliest writers do not operate on that premise. How could they? There were no extant commentaries, and the ones that existed often taught errors, as St. Jerome relays in his account of uh, the uh, illustrious men of Irenaeus and Justin Martyr on Revelation and premillennialism. At best, the consensus of the fathers is an excellent place to find how God superintended his best men. Nonetheless, that need not entail infallibility, just general providence and reliability. Furthermore, later consensuses often replace earlier ones. As we hinted at earlier, there was an early consensus in favor of premillennialism. All millennialism soon upended that early majority. Such reasoning also applies to councils. There is no promise given in the scriptures or testified by the earliest fathers, at least not to my knowledge. The general councils and the consensus of bishops therein are protected from doctrinal or jurisdictional errors. Several fathers testify against such a viewpoint. St. Augustine, for instance, his work against the Donatist, where he deals with uh, general councils in Book 2, Chapter 3. Augustine's model is much sounder. Councils can err, but they have authority until another council corrects their error. The four set of traditions are entities or facts signified or deduced from the scriptures. As rational beings, we can learn the proper sense of the scriptures by deducing firm consequences from the grammar and context of a given passage. Jesus uses good and necessary consequences in his discourse with the Sadducees, proving the resurrection from the present tense language of Exodus 3. St. Peter testifies that all the prophets bear witness that we have the forgiveness of sins for Christ's sake. They did not say that statement explicitly, but rather they implied it by good and necessary consequence. Our Trinitarian theology is of like quality, as is our baptismal theology. Tradition four is only improperly to be called a tradition. As for the fifth set of traditions, the Ventintian canon, or the VC, is helpful but not demonstrative. The VC often confirms that the sense of scriptures is right and clear, but we can find witnesses to the precise sense in every age. As Lutherans, we contend all our doctrines have some patristic support. But this consensus, taken inclusively, exists on perhaps one or two doctrines, the real presence in some form or another, and baptismal efficacy. As Heiko Oberman argues, the VC has five criteria. Here they are. One, the opinion was held by all the fathers. Two, the formulation of the doctrine was held exactly the same. Three, their opinion was openly and explicitly formulated. 
Four, their opinion was repeatedly advanced. And five, their opinion was continuously held, taught, and ridden, and taught. Taken consistently, almost no doctrines would stand with this criteria in place, especially if the post-schism West is in the equation. And that is the kicker. By excluding entire church branches, the East, the East neuters St. Vincent's principle of much of its a priori pull. Moreover, the scriptures and her writers are themselves part of this, that which is believed everywhere at every time by all criteria. The person who denies that conclusion begs the question in favor of his traditional schema. Indeed, if the scriptures testify to a conclusion not received by the majority of the fathers, it is safer for us to believe the consensus of all the prophets, as St. Peter says. The sixth set of traditions can be and often are beneficial. In and of themselves, these traditions, whether apostolic or not, are things indifferent, adiaphora. Yet who can deny they often help aid in ordering the church Catholic, both in prudence and in equity? The ordinary succession of bishops, triple immersion and baptism, the use of images are all pious, if fallible, and sometimes late developments. They are adornments to the true biblical worship, not new acts of worship per se. They can also be adjusted if new circumstances arise. For instance, if you minister in a particularly iconoclastic area and or you baptize babies in an inherently cold climate. Moreover, suppose these late adiaphora are imposed on us as matters of salvation. In that case, they cease to be adiaphora and evolve into pure heathenry. Circumcision was adiaphora, but it ceased to be when it was presented as a mandate necessary to justification. The Pharisees' traditions of men are another example of this legalistic tendency to say rights are necessary for our acceptance before God. However, we admit not all adiaphora are created, created equal. The church should be regulated well. So with that said, we, we will deal with apostolic tradition. Here's what we grant about apostolic tradition. We do grant the apostles deliver directions to the churches orally, as 2 Thessalonians 2.15 teaches. Nevertheless, we maintain that these apostolic traditions are one of two things. One, adiaphora customs put in place by the apostles for the sake of good order, largely local mandates in keeping with the laws of Christian charity, or two, oral information doctrinally identical to that which was later inscripturated. For tradition taken as a Catholic enterprise is not an epistemically reliable guide. In fact, in 2 Thessalonians 2, St. Paul is writing against a false tradition that popped up early in the apostolic days, a tradition attributed to him and his compatriots that the last days had already begun. Well, for an instance of a customary tradition, we appeal to the apostolic example. Such an example is not always binding on the church Catholic, at least not in precisely the same way it was binding on those it was intended for. For instance, it is perhaps scandalous to greet each person you encounter with a holy kiss in the year of our Lord 2022, thus subverting the principle of charity that had the law in place in the first place. Similarly, Jesus' breathing on the apostles is not taken to be a necessary part of the ordination rite for all times and places. These are customs for good order and Christian love, not necessarily rites for perpetuity. So we, we assert the Thessalonian tradition is in one of these two genera. Resultantly, we maintain the doctrinal content of the apostles' theology is now totally revealed in the scriptures, not adiaphora in liturgical tradition or word-of-mouth testimony. The state of things was different prior to the end of the apostolic age, which is why the text is not directly applicable to Sola Scriptura as such. For confirmation, we appeal to the earliest explicit traditions, Paul's use of the Lord's Supper tradition in the Creed in 1 Corinthians 15, plus the role of faith in St. Irenaeus which are either liturgical customs or oral applications of the scripture analogy of faith. The burden of proof is on our opponents to prove they are substantially distinct. So with that said, we will now need to defend uh, the doctrinal and formal sufficiency of scripture. How might we do that? First, we can appeal to the example of history. Uh, general equity dictates that God over time inscripturates the word, a word he first delivered orally, but which was liable to manifold corruption. We prove this by the example of Moses, who worked with earlier traditions, delivered up through Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and etc. To all indications, God has preserved that method of working in the apostolic era. The church is one and undivided across both covenants, where we all eat and drink of the same Christ. Men still struggle with the same weakness of memory, immorality, exhaustion, shortness of life, and all the rest which made scripture necessary in the first place. Furthermore, there is the analogy of the prophetic word with the oral one. Simply put, the apostles wrote what they preached. We argue from the analogy of Acts 2, 16 through 18 and Joel 2, 28. 1 John 1, 3 likewise confirms this principle. 
St. Peter asserts that which Joel audibly delivered is what he wrote down. St. Paul preached the entire council of God's word. What we see him preach in Acts is precisely the content he writes down in his epistles. We infer the word of God, oral or written, is accidentally distinct as regards its mode, not substantially different. This is consistent with what St. Irenaeus says about the motive for the Apostle's authorship of Holy Written against Heresies Book 3, Chapter 1, as well. Secondly, we appeal to the doctrinal clarity of Scripture. There is no necessity of tradition, and hence a strong presumption against it as a Catholic role of faith, for nature does nothing in vain. In defense of the doctrinal clarity of sacred Scripture, the Apostles yearned to have their letters read to the entire Church. All Christians are priests and kings, and the word pertains to them. Indeed, congregational role is the property of all the called, as Matthew 18, 18 says. As such, St. Paul writes to gathered assemblies, telling them to be wary even of their teachers. He makes the dogmatic teaching, his dogmatic teaching rather, summed up in Galatians, a judge over angels, over other renowned men. For the Christian church has the right of judging and testing all things, and she judges on the basis of her foundation, the apostles and prophets. The law and the gospel, the central division of scripture, are only relatively unclear to those who are perishing. St. Peter mentions unstable and unruly men like these in his second epistle, who perverted Paul's eschatology to justify heathenry. Nevertheless, by, but by way of inversion, the word and its meaning will be relatively straightforward to those who use the means rightly. These means include the analogy of faith, analysis of context and genre, the default assumption of the literal sense, prayer, the correct use of the ministry, etc. Of course, our opponents might argue that not everyone is literate. However, as the Anglican Bishop John Joel says, they who cannot read can hear from their ministers. The form of the scriptures, the etchings and letters may not be apparent to these, but the material, the doctrinal content, is abundantly clear. Thirdly, we argue from the perfection of scripture. The scriptures contain all things necessary to lead us to eternal life. That is their end, as 2 Thessala, 2 Timothy 3 and uh, John 5 teach. We likewise, we can reach eternal life if we in interpret the scriptures according to their sense, even the OT scriptures as Jesus relates. If the OT scriptures are capable of their end, how much more will the NT scriptures be? The scriptures are so perfect concerning their end that no role can be added to them. Indeed, no dogmatical traditional role. And this also applies to works, which are the appointed path of God to reach eternal life. Of course, the pious reading of scripture will require means. We should never seek a foreign sense to the scripture, for no scripture is of a man's own private interpretation. But the entire counsel of God's word is the Spirit's voice. When we apply the analogy of faith, interpreting the unclear utterances of one prophet by the clear utterances of another, we interpret with the Catholic spirit. So lastly and most importantly, the scriptures provide a criterion for sola scriptura, a bar that holds into the apostolic era. Man cannot add to God's word, Deuteronomy 4.2. Only God can do that. God does this by appointing prophets who speak none other than what he commands them, 2 Peter 1.20. Now let the prophets speak, they write down as a witness to the church. We proved this earlier with our first argument from the necessity of scripture. We have every reason to think this principle holds into the apostolic era. St. John in Revelation gives an almost identical formula to what's going on in Deuteronomy 4.2. Since God makes additions, inductively speaking, only by inspiring new scripture, we can assume Sola Scripture as our default position, thereby ex excluding extra-biblical, dogmatical tradition. And with that said, uh, we thank our opponent, and we hope and look forward to this being a good debate. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for that 15-minute opening statement. All right. Uh, Luther and Father Jonathan, you guys are up for your 15-minute opening statement, and I will start your time when you begin to speak. Okay, I think I'm going first, and I have to see Marlon about getting my um, PowerPoint up and running. So let me now share that. Can you see that? I sure can. All right, so we have it here, and so you should be able to transition, and I'll start your time when you begin. Okay, well, we're here tonight to discuss whether sola scriptura, or Orthodox Church tradition, are enough for a proper understanding of true doctrine and right teaching. Now, first, let's be clear. The Orthodox Church herself believes Scripture to be God-breathed and authoritative, as St. Paul clearly outlines to St. Timothy. 
and the value, worth, authority, preeminence, and so much more are made clear again and again by the early church fathers. These are just a few examples from the fourth and fifth centuries when the entire biblical canon was being finalized. Now, what do the scriptures themselves say about sola scriptura versus the proper orthodox tradition of proper interpretation by God-inspired men? Do the scriptures stand on their own? Do they actually say that? Well, the scriptures say a couple of things that we need, we need to keep in mind. St. Paul, in his message to the Corinthians, reminded them to keep the traditions that, they, that he had delivered to them, not written ones necessarily, but perhaps oral and perhaps written. But clearly in the context of the Greek word, paradisos, traditions here mean those things that he taught to them. In 2 Thessalonians, he reminded that church not to have anything to do with anybody that did not keep the traditions that he had already passed down to them. And famously, in 2 Thessalonians 2.15, uh, St. Paul admonishes them to stand fast and hold to the traditions, the things which had been passed on, which you were taught, whether by word or by all our epistle. The New Testament itself gives ample evidence of the need for proper spiritual insight and illumination from the proper teachers and the proper teaching in order to do proper interpretation. And before St. Paul ever wrote any of these things, there is this by St. Luke in the Acts of the Holy Apostles, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Do you understand what you are reading, he said. The eunuch replied, how can I unless someone guides me? It is clear from the context that the eunuch is not asking for, and Philip is not giving him any new revelation, but authoritative guidance. St. Luke thought enough of the incident to include it, and clearly the eunuch was inviting him to teach and interpret and guide in only the way the apostles could. And that authoritative teaching can only come from the Holy Spirit. Notice in John chapter 14, Jesus says, the Holy Spirit will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all things that I have said to you. He does not say, I'll give you a book to read. I'll leave you a letter to, to read between all of you, but I will teach you all things through the sending of the Holy Spirit who will guide you into all truth and teach you all things. Similarly, Earlier in the chronological uh, timeline on the road to Caesarea Philippi, Jesus and answered uh, and said to uh, Simon Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you or, by the way, any particular writings, but my Father who is in heaven. Now, in all of these cases, uh, it's very clear to we Orthodox that in this case and in others, particular specific men inspired by the Holy Spirit, sent by God, interpret scripture. Now, having said that, we could then ask the question, why aren't the scriptures sufficient in and of themselves? Why do we need to have, uh, if the canon of scripture is complete, a church or any church interpret it? The scriptures can be easily misunderstood, and St. Peter makes that very clear in his second epistle when he already points out that Paul's epistles um, because of their spiritual complexity, uh, which contain without a doubt spiritual truths, require spiritual wisdom and discernment, uh, other people were already uh, twisting them to their own destruction as they do the rest of scriptures. Therefore, they are not interpreted in the same sense by everyone. Even in the Lutheran communion, even within the two most conservative groups, one of which is represented here tonight, there is a difference of opinion and teaching holding to the proper interpretation of scripture. One person thinks a certain text means one thing, while another person can think the exact opposite. The result is a falling away of communion, shared ministry, and so much more. If anyone claims to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God, how can that one Holy Spirit, who is supposed to lead us into all truth, bring people to vastly differing conclusions, whether infant baptism, Holy Communion, losing your salvation? There can be many interpreters and many interpretations such that the entire legacy of the Reformation is not in communion with each other. So how do we acquire the mind of the New Testament era, both a cognitive framework and a sacramental illumination, which is accomplished through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the mind of the writers of the New Testament and their disciples and their disciples' disciples down through hundreds of years? 
As we have seen earlier, revelation comes from the spirit, not from some mental exercise and correct understanding, according to one's own understanding and thus interpretation. Interpretation is key since scripture condemns both heresy and schism. We cannot affirm false teaching. We cannot go into schism with one another over false teaching. This creates a problem for proponents of sola scriptura. If there isn't an infallible source for it, then heresy and schism will happen. In fact, St. Paul already warned of this in his second epistle to Timothy. Heresy and schism can happen if anybody is allowed to make the rules. And of course, what we know from history is turn away from truth they did back in the first several centuries, beginning in the first century with Gnostics and moving forward in time with them, we have seen people twist and turn the scriptures to their own means, all of them arguing from scripture itself. Nowadays, not much has changed between Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and I don't know, uh, maybe other groups. Um, we are letting people draw their own conclusions about what the Bible really means. So if the heretics did it then, guys, I'm kidding, by the way, and still do it to this day, if they all appeal to scripture, how do the scriptures then stand on their own? The answer is found in St. Paul's exhortation to St. Timothy. In his apostolically, in Timothy's apostolically ordained ministry, the things which you have heard from me among many witnesses, heard from me, among many witnesses, commit these two faithful men who will be able to teach others. So we have St. Paul in the first generation teaching Timothy in the second generation, who is being charged with teaching others in further generations from generation to generation. What would be um, such an apostolic transmission and why we would say would such an apostolic transmission not merely be correct, but binding on a proper rule of faith because he was chosen to apostolically carry on the authority of the apostolic ministry of Paul himself. So this is a transmission that we call apostolic succession, which is not merely a mechanical laying on of hands from one generation to the next, but which is the transmission of the apostles preaching and teaching faithfully kept and handed on the very definition of tradition from one generation to the next. And even St. John knew and understand this and taught this in his first epistle. The apostle clearly knew who he was, clearly knew where his authority came from. We, he says, are of God. He who knows God hears us, hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. They don't understand. They can't understand. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. This is critically important because Lutherans deny that ministers have the kind of required authority implied here, but the appeal that St. John is making is to the authorized and commissioned ministers of the apostolic order, not to the biblical text itself. So truth is transmitted not by writings from generation to generation, but by those who have been taught by the apostles, heard what they taught, faithfully kept it, and faithfully handed it on. All right, and I believe that's the conclusion of Jonathan. Father Jonathan, and so I believe Luther Menard, you are up. Uh, you got it, man. All right. We believe in the church, just as we read in the Nicene Creed in 381 AD, as taught by the entire church prior to any schism, and we know that the Spirit will lead and guide her into all truth, as stated by Holy Scripture. To build on what Father Jonathan expressed, I want to specifically analyze why Sola Scriptura is false and not the true rule of faith. The doctrine of sola scriptura is not expressed in scripture. Protestant scholar Gavin Orland, Orland uh, grants this point that commonly, commonly used texts like 2 uh, Timothy 3.16, 2 Peter 1.20.21, and so on and so forth, does not get one to sola scriptura. The core parts of sola scriptura that we need to see to get to sola scriptura are scripture being the sole infallible rule of faith, the doctrine of the right of private judgment, and as a result, scripture being the final authority. All of them have to be ex expressed in scripture, but they aren't. So sola scriptura fails its own test and is self-refuting. Not only so sola scriptura not found in scripture, but scripture contradicts sola scriptura by its appeal to authoritative oral teaching. In the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul praises the church that met there for remembering the traditions 
just as he delivered to them in 1 Corinthians 11, 2. A common verse that is brought up in regards to apostolic affirmation of holy tradition is 2 Thessalonians 2, 15, which states, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or epistle, or our epistle. And St. John Chrysostom, a fourth century early church father, comments on this stating, and I quote, hence, it is manifest that they did not deliver all things by epistles, but many things unwritten and in like manner, both the one and the other are worthy of credit. Therefore, let us think the tradition of the church also worthy of credit. It is a tradition, seek no further, end quote. Some of the more gla glaringly obvious issues with Sola Scriptura is that of a self-authenticating canon. First, Sola Scriptura presupposes an authoritatively closed canon of scripture. To affirm Sola Scriptura is the only infallible source of doctrine assumes that there is an authoritative judgment as to what exactly does or does not constitute scripture. Pro as Protestant scholar Lee McDonald points out, this ignores the process of the canon of the New Testament that took centuries, which was heavily influenced by the liturgy of the early church, which many Protestants and evangelicals don't even have. The reality is the canonical functions of scripture was liturgical. Many books were circulating at the time and the first extended list of the New Testament we're aware of that matches our canon list is in St. A St. Athanasius' Festal Letter in 367 AD and is extended in the West at the Council of Carthage in, 390, uh, in 397 AD. So, Sola Scriptura, so in the early, so early Christians didn't believe in Sola Scriptura, and you have a minimum of three centuries where they can't practice it rightly. Now, why would God make that the rule of faith if Christians in that era couldn't faithfully practice it? This is improbable and if not absurd. Furthermore, some books that many Protestants unknowingly call Apocrypha are understood to be canonical Holy Scripture by early church fathers who use the Greek Septuagint. Early church fathers like St. Athanasius and, uh, or St. Augustine affirm books like Baruch and, and, and Wisdom, for example, as Holy Scripture. Ironically, many Protestants seek continuity in faith with the early church fathers but show their inconsistency by advocating for their new revised canon and heterodox beliefs. Another issue with Sola Scriptura is it presupposes the scriptures are self-interpreting. I heard it said once, what good is an infallible book without an infallible interpretation? When it comes to Sola Scriptura, there's no ultimately authoritative way to adjudicate theological disputes and maintain the unity of the church that Christ expresses. Simply look at the fruit of the tree Sola Scriptura produces. There's a, denom there's, denom there's a plethora of denominations, and there's even splits within denominational lines which use the exact same confessional documents. Many groups today breed personality cults where the ministry takes on the identity and vision of one guy. Professor Clark Carlton in his work, The Way, says, in every doctrinal controversy of the early church, the issues were settled not by an appeal to a naked scriptural text, but by interpreting the scriptures within the context of the church's ongoing life. The question is not, and never has been, what does the scripture say, but rather, what does it mean? And on April 18th, 1521, at the trial of the Diet of Worms, Luther is remembered for these iconic words, and I quote, unless I am convinced by the testimony of Holy Scripture or by the or evident reason, for I can believe neither Pope nor counsel alone, as it is clear that they have erred and repeatedly contradicted themselves, I consider myself uh, convicted by the testimony of Holy Scripture, which is my basis and my conscience is captive to the word of God. Thus I cannot and will not recant because acting against one's conscience is neither safe nor sound. God help me. Amen. End quote. Orthodox apologist Perry Robinson, in his article, Are You Flying Solo?, points out a foundational flaw in, that is essential for Sola Scriptura to work, and that is the, the Protestant doctrine of the right of private judgment. And that's understood as a Christian individual is ultimately obligated to adhere to belief X if and only if they judge, determine, or assess belief X to be scriptural. So when it comes to Sola Scriptura, Luther is only ultimately obligated to ascend to any given doctrine if and only if he judges it to be scriptural. That is, his conscience plays an ultimately normative role 
here superior than the church. But this idea is not expressed anywhere in scripture. If anything, scripture gives us plenty of examples of the church rendering judgments that have a final, that finally settle a matter which individuals are obligated to ascend to, like Acts 15, for example, which means soul scriptura at its core makes the individual the ultimate authority and not Christ. That's why Protestantism looks as diverse and divided as the people that hold to it. The reality is no father or council or early church ever asserted that the scriptures in and of themselves without reference to the church is the all sufficient rule of faith. And if sola scriptura is false, then Protestantism is false. And at that point, just like Islam, this text based religion is false. Now we love our Protestant friends. And our prayer is that this debate opens the door for one to embrace the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, which is the Orthodox Church. Concede my time. All right. Thank you guys so much for that. And now we're going to transition into our rebuttal rounds. Now, once again, these are seven minute rebuttals for each team. So make sure you manage your time wisely. Uh, that said, I got Tony Nash and Cameron who are up for their seven minute rebuttal. And let me know when you're, right, I'll start your time when you begin to speak. I think you're muted, Tony. Tony. Tony, we, we, we can't hear you. They're still Sorry. Can't hear you. Sorry. Hey, can you guys hear me now? Yeah, we hear yeah. you now. All right. We thank our opponents for their thoughtful opening statement. Since their opening was split into a positive case for orthodoxy and a negative case against scriptura, I'll begin by addressing the arguments for orthodoxy, and Cameron, my friend, will address the arguments against our position. So let me go over some of uh, Father Jonathan's arguments. So he did grant that the Orthodox Church does find scripture as an authority, but it's not really the final infallible authority. It's ultimately the church that is uh, the ultimate infallible authority, uh, guided by the uh, interpretive authority by the successors to the apostles. Now, one thing I want to point out right off the bat is, and I believe orthodoxy does grant this, that not every single individual person who's ordained by a bishop is infallible. In fact, uh, many orthodox bishops throughout history have erred greatly teaching heresies have been excommunicated from councils, etc. So simply being ordained uh, by a successor of the apostle does not guarantee you're going to teach anything correctly. In fact, there has to be something above them that other people in the church judge them by. In fact, I want to uh, quote uh, Paul in Romans 16, 17, where he tells people in the church to avoid anyone who comes to you with any strange doctrine, uh, uh, contrary to what he has taught them meaning that the congregation in Rome was able to look at this letter that Paul wrote to them and see what the doctrines were that they that he taught them. And if anyone says anything different uh, than what Paul said to them, they're to reject them. So Father John lists a couple scripture passages to show that uh, actually there's oral traditions passed outside of scripture. Now we want to go back to our opening statement to show that our opponents have to prove that these oral traditions are of a completely different substantive content than anything recorded in the scriptures, which they haven't proven yet. So we want to wait to see what they're going to do with that argument. So let's just go to, he talked about how Paul talks about in first Corinthians about uh, passing on these oral preachings and traditions. Uh, Paul talking about preaching to Corinthians. Well, the traditions that Paul explicitly mentions in that epistle are things like the Lord's Supper, how they were passed down to him. So that was something preached to Paul, but clearly no one would deny that the Lord's Supper is recorded in Scripture. Another one is the resurrection or uh, this creedal statement that Paul cites in 1 Corinthians 15. So he also cites uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.15. Uh, so one thing I want to say about that is that uh, they have to prove, again, that these are of a different content than uh, what's recorded anywhere else in Scripture. Um, and they also have to prove that these these traditions passed down to the Thessalonians are specific oral traditions their own church body today holds to, which is an extremely hard task to accomplish. There's nothing, there's no hint that these people were taught veneration of icons, for example. Uh, However, we can actually have pretty strong confidence what these traditions passed down by Paul in this epistle were by word of mouth. Uh, Paul is recorded by Luke in uh, Acts 17, 1 through 4, 
uh, of preaching to uh, the Thessalonians the gospel from the Old Testament scriptures. Um, and Paul reiterates exactly what he preached to them in First Thessalonians, Thessalonians 1, 5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in as much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. So another argument he makes is of the Ethiopian eunuch. Well, the Ethiopian eunuch couldn't understand the scriptures, so he needed someone to explain it to him. Well, a couple points about the Ethiopian eunuch is that, well, he was a foreigner. He never grew up around hearing the scriptures. Uh, he didn't really understand the concept of what a Messiah was. And so when he's reading Isaiah 53, which is the passage he is confused by, uh, he just needs to give be given some context clues. Uh, the uh, essence of his uh, misunderstanding of the text was he didn't know who he was talking about. So what uh, uh, Philip did, who was, a de who was a deacon, by the way, not this uh, infallible successor bishop of the apostles, uh, is he explains uh, to the Ethiopian eunuch that is Jesus. And he goes through other passages in the scriptures that Jesus explains in Luke 24 uh, to his disciples that the scriptures testify about Jesus. Um, so another thing he was arguing is that, well, Jesus passes down spiritual like wisdom, not anywhere recorded in scripture. Jesus, in fact, didn't write anything. He didn't give us a book at all. Well, I want to cite an argument from St. Augustine in On the Harmony of the Gospels, Book 1, Chapter 35, Paragraph 54. He says, quote, Therefore, when those disciples have written matters which he, Jesus, declared and spoke to them, it ought by, not by any means be said that he has written nothing himself, since the truth is that his members have accomplished only what they became acquainted with by repeated statements of the head. For all that he was minded to give our pursuit on the subject of his own doings and sayings, he commanded to be written by those disciples whom he thus used as if they were his own hands. So according to Augustine, every single thing that we need to know that Jesus said was recorded in the four gospels by the disciples, which is a complete refutation of what Father Jonathan said. Another thing is in uh, Tractate 49 of John's gospel. Uh, Augustine is quoted saying on the passage of John 20, 31, that, uh, you know, that, Everything that was written in the Gospel of John, that's sufficient for our salvation. So that's all I want to say for now, and I'll go ahead and give the reins to Cameron. Yeah, I only have a minute to work with, so I'll deal with what Luther said. So sola scriptura is implied by good and necessary consequence. So what he said about, uh, you know, uh, explicit proof text wasn't necessary. I dealt with that in my opening statement. Uh, he mentioned 1 Corinthians 11 again. Again, contextually, it's talking about head coverings. Uh, you know, and I would say this is a Christian charity issue. Uh, it, it's a matter of showing headship. Uh, scripture self-authenticating. Uh, I, I would just say that, like, disagreement and uh, a process doesn't have anything to do with the problem of self-authentication. People have different measures of the spirit, and that affects how soon they receive something. And there were also transmission issues, but that doesn't say anything about what you're discussing. So scripture is both dogmatic and liturgical. I disagree with what Luther said there. He appealed to the canon argument. I sort of addressed that in my opening statement. Uh, private judgment is an important thing. And uh, in fact, Augustine himself is who Luther is quoting in the opening. I do not accept their teaching as true on mere grounds of the opinion of being held by them, but only because they have succeeded in convincing my opinion of its truth, either by means of the canon canonical writings itself themselves or by arguments addressed to reason. So, so while Luther is accusing Luther of being very unpatristic, ironic that Luther is accusing Luther, uh, ironically, Luther is being far more patristic than uh, Luther in our debate is being. And with that, I will close our case. All right. All right. Uh, thank you for that. All right, Luther and Father Jonathan, you guys are up for your seven minute rebuttal. Let me restart you guys' time. Uh, before you guys start, let me uh, peel back that time a little bit so you guys get that seven minutes. Hold on one second. Oh. I'm getting there. I'm trying to get it right on point. All right. You guys got it for seven minutes, guys. Luther, please. All right. I open Let's the see. 
Okay, okay. I mean, there there's a couple things that that were mentioned. Uh, so they so one thing that the, uh, was mentioned that the scriptures are there's clear the you know uh, perspicuity of scripture or whatnot. Well, that's kind of begging the question. Like, what it, what exactly? How do you know which ones are clear and which ones are unclear? Right? Because in the case of when you brought up the Ethiopian Ethiopian eunuch, uh, you know, Father Philip, Father uh, Jonathan, I'm sorry about that. Um, in, in that case, like you would think that it would just be simple or clear, right? Now, if if it comes to you know clarity of scripture, you can look. There would not be this this division amongst all the reformers, right? You know, you have some people that say, okay, well, it's clear that you know this is the actual body and blood of Christ. It's it's right here in John three, uh, uh, John chapter six. You have other people that say, no, that's that's definitely not there. It's you know it's it's definitely a spiritual presence or or that's totally off. Um, you just go down the line, you know, whether it's baptism, whether it's other doctrines, right? And anybody can make an argument. It's 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 up to that person. It comes right back to uh, the right of private judgment um, that we talked about. And I know Cam mentioned that I'm accusing Luther. Luther's accusing Luther. Um, well, at the end of the day, one we we've never said that fathers were infallible, right? And if he if he quotes uh, Saint Augustine. He's still, whether using his reason or judgment, it, whether it's a father or whether it's the scriptures, he's deciding what it means to him, what makes sense to him. So um, that's what we're kind of pushing back against, right? Um, there's some other things um, that that were said that caught my attention. Um, so also you mentioned um, scripture. Uh, scripture provides a criteria. I don't, I don't remember what I wrote here, but. He, uh, he he quoted Saint Irenaeus, and and in quoting Saint Irenaeus, as to kind of like make a case for that. Well, if you read against heresies, clearly you would know that he he does not affirm sola scriptura in any kind of way, right? He appeals to the church, he appeals to the tradition, right? And and even if you look at the consensus of the fathers, which was something that they 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 kind of tackled in their opener, constantly you see the fathers, whether it's referencing the, you know, uh, obey the bishop or whether it's rep rep uh, referencing the unwritten traditions of the church that they saw and followed. You know, you have St. Basil who says, you know, scripture, you know, and unwritten traditions of the same force, right? And so if they're if they're pulling from the patristic, I think it's, like I said earlier in, the, in my opening, it, it's kind of inconsistent because we can look and just look at the practice of the early church fathers that they did not hold to sola scriptura, uh, you know, based on how they, they lived and practiced. But Father, I'll, I'll let you dive in and get some stuff that maybe you wanted to chat about. Well, Tony kind of raised a straw man at the beginning of his objections, of, at the beginning of his rebuttal. He, he said, is anyone ordained in the Orthodox Church infallible? I, I'm Tony, I'm kind of paraphrasing you. Uh, we, of course not, we've never claimed that. Um, but as a matter of fact, where he tried to say there has to be something above them and what's above them is scripture. In our church, St. Mark of Ephesus pointed this out when, when there was controversy in the 15th century about who was right and who was wrong over particular things. He pointed out, as our church has always kind of pointed out, that the fathers can be fallible, but church councils, when they come together under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, can be infallible. We believe that the decisions of ecumenical councils uh, determine the consensus of the patristic evidence and the patristic statements. So it, it's not that any one church father or priest or bishop or anybody is infallible. None of them are infallible. All of them, we would say, can be fallible. And some have proven to, uh, even some of the saints in our church have written things that are rejected by the church. But it's the church council that has been set up in the Orthodox Church, which determines the consensus of the fathers, who was right, how many were right about what, and so forth and so on. So I just want to point that out. Um, also, regarding the story about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, that the eunuch would not understand because he wasn't Jewish or whatever, that would be a surprising statement to make to the Ethiopians because they claim a tradition that goes back to Solomon of their country being Jewish until the gospel was brought there. So you would be incorrect in affirming and claiming 
that the eunuch did not understand what he was reading because he was not Jewish or couldn't read Hebrew or whatever the excuse was. That's not what they say about themselves. That's not what their history bears witness to. The Ethiopian eunuch could not understand what he was reading from Isaiah because he had no Holy Spirit to show him exactly how to understand what was being read. It wasn't until a spirit-filled Philip showed up that Philip was able to authoritatively explain to the eunuch what it was he was reading and what it meant. Um, now, let me just mention one more thing. I have about a minute left. Um, I'm very happy to see you guys quoting from the church fathers. We love that in orthodoxy. We love to see our Protestant friends quoting from the fathers, but you guys are cherry picking what you're quoting. And this father says this, so we agree with him, and this is great, and we can we can quote him, you know, this. But you know what? You can't quote one father saying one thing and ignore everything else they're saying. Uh, what's very clear in this debate to us is the question, what happened to the church after the apostles died? What was the manner of transmission of teaching and so forth after the apostles died? And clearly, when you read about those men who had been perhaps taught by Titus or Timothy or who knows, and who had formed the third and fourth generation of authorities uh, in the church, clearly what are called the early church fathers, the apostolic fathers, what they wrote and what they preached and what record we have of them that's been left behind makes very clear that sola scriptura was not the teaching back then, that the authority in the church was the apostolic authority that had been passed down from bishop to bishop from generation to generation to godly, faithful men who kept what they were taught and passed it on faithfully. All right, you gonna let that last 10 seconds roll off, guys? Uh, I thought you'd pop and get, get one more rebuttal in there real quick, huh? Uh yeah, yeah, okay. I got five seconds. Uh, the use of images being a later development, uh, what's the justification for that? You know, like how would you, well, time's up, but we, I, would, I guess we'll, we'll pick that back up. All right. All right. Good stuff, guys. Appreciate the openings and the rebuttals. I uh, got a lot out of them. I'm back here listening. And the audience is definitely engaged with what you guys are saying. So now we're about to transition to the funnest and most exciting part of every debate, which is the cross-examination. Uh, once again, this will be a total of 40 minutes. Both parties to get 20 minutes each to uh, ask questions. Uh, and that, make sure if you can answer the question with a simple yes or no, please do that. Uh, we do not want to turn this into a monologue. We do want to keep the dialogue going on. Um, so uh, with that said, uh, Mr. Tony and Cameron, you guys are up first for your 20 minute cross examination of Father Jonathan and Luther Menard. Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> all right, um, so in terms of these questions, do you want me to just ask one of you guys a specific, uh, a specific question or just ask them to both to you and just you choose who answers it? Uh, you you, uh, you can go either way, Tony. You can no. ask us and we'll figure out, or you can address it to either either one of us, whatever you want to do. No, they can ask both of us. What they're trying to do is find a mouse in the house. The, like, if there's yeah, a term in bathroom where you, you, you kind of try to find <laughs> most, most, most stuff, muzzy yeah. bugs, basically. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, no, if you guys, good, good, if you guys want to, so we'll pause real quick. Let me give a little clarification. So if you guys ask a question, and so for example, Tony, if you ask a question to Jonathan or Luther, both of them can engage with the question. You know what I mean? Okay. So it's not just directed to one person, though you can do that, but Luther can also jump in and, and deal with it as well. So if you guys yeah, want to do it that good. way. All right. Sure. That sounds good to me. Okay, great. Uh, so, Father Jonathan, I did actually want to ask you one question because you did mention how not individual uh, teachers in the church are infallible, but when they all come together in what is called an ecumenical council, that's when they are, are guided by the Holy Spirit uh, and protected from any error. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, so, how many well, – I don't know if I can ask leading questions here. Let me just ask, uh, would you agree that, um, that if individual fathers are uh, not infallible 
and in fact, there's no one individual teacher in the church that is infallible, uh, then uh, isn't it a little bit arbitrary to say that when a unidentified amount of number of bishops come together that they're now infallible? Well, it, it's a little bit uh, more nuanced than that. Um, we've had ecumenical councils with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bishops attending, and we've had ecumenical councils with a very small number attending. And it's not the number attending. It's whether through them the Holy Spirit speaks authoritatively about an issue that the council is trying to address, whether in the first council it was Arianism, in the second council it was Macedonians, in the third council and fourth council we had the, uh, the, the debates about the Theotokos, and then again about Christ's two natures. All of the ecumenical councils, if you look them, addressed essentially one thing, and that was Christology. All of the ecumenical councils addressed something about Christology. And in that sense, the councils came together and determined what did he say, what did he say, what did he say, what was he taught, who did he hear it from, and so forth. And all of this was brought together in the first and second ecumenical councils. And then subsequently, each ecumenical council, when convened, confirmed, you might say, the minutes of the previous one in that there is a continuity from first to second to third all the way through what we would call the seventh and possibly even beyond. So we believe that the Holy Spirit acts through the assembly of God-ordained bishops to determine what the truth of the church is. If it's not clear, and, and it hasn't been clear when these various... Uh, well, it was clear, but, you know, these these heresies would arise and they had to be addressed somehow. Yeah. And, so you would say that the, these did. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Luther. I'm sorry. No, no you're good. You got it. Uh, so would you agree that this is not true of local councils, even if there's like a thousand bishops at a local council? That's not infallible, but only when it's dubbed ecumenical, like when an emperor calls a council, then it's infallible. Is that the position? Tony, that's a good question. Not every council that has been called at, at, at what we would think of as an ecumenical level, not every council was ecumenical. There have been robber councils and, and things like that. Um, and by the way, there are there have been local councils that were called, which then later on were accepted by the church, not necessarily maybe as ecumenical, but having weight and authority to speak for the entire church. So there have been both, but eventually it's not like a council convenes like the one recently in Crete and the church says, oh, we're convening an ecumenical council. Convening it and calling it are not the same thing. The church accepts it as ecumenical and thus speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit for the truth of the church, usually over time. It usually takes a while for those churches to be, uh, for those councils to be declared ecumenical. They're not done so right away. So is it simply by declaring it's ecumenical, like an ex cathedra statement by the Pope, it is now infallible? Is that your position? Is that correct? No. Um, the, the councils are ecumenical when the entire church accepts them. I mean, the, the bishops came back from Florence and Ferrara uh, in, in the 15th century. Uh, one, almost every single bishop except one, Mark of Ephesus, came back wanting to reunite with Rome. And when they came back from those councils, it was the people in the Orthodox churches of, of the Ecumeni at the time, the Eastern Roman Empire, who rejected the results of those councils and, and practically threw some of those bishops out of their cathedrals. The people did not accept it. Um, whereas many other councils uh, were widely accepted, even when they were convening people to said, oh, this is wonderful. We're, we're talking about great things here and settling big disputes. So it, again, the church does not convene a council and immediately call it ecumenical. The church convenes a council and then sees over time that what was done there and proclaimed there and debated there and decided there was truly of the Holy Spirit. That does not necessarily happen right away. It may happen by the time the next one is called, but it doesn't happen right away. Yeah, and to piggyback off what Father Jonathan is saying, like you, you get it right directly in the scriptures, you could see something similar, right? You, you see in Acts 15, it seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit, where the, the, the apostles, they came together, right? They had, they, they disputed in, you know, at the Jerusalem Council, but then at the same time, they went, they affirmed that the Holy Spirit, right? And they, they also, they also said us and the Holy Spirit and the church accepted it, so. Um, that speaks right, to exactly have, what Father. You have, 
Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, but you also have local councils like the Council of Carthage that say it, it was good to us and by the guidance of the spirit, we say these things, right? So there are local councils who will use that kind of formula sometimes. Uh, even the Missouri Synod will talk about, you know, being guided by the spirit in prayer and asking for his guidance and making a decision. But we don't claim the Missouri Synod is infallible, just simply, you know, even though we are we don't we do believe that the church is being guided by the spirit uh i guess let me let me go into a different direction i think the missouri senate's infallible yeah <laughs> yes Wait, can we, you, can you yeah. say that again i i, I said a joke <laughs> that didn't go over too well oh, okay, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah i guess i, I, I do have a I party laugh, father jonathan <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it. I thought it was funny. Right. Yeah. We we accept it as ecumenical, so that's why it's infallible. Uh, just kidding. Um, but I guess are let me segue. Are you, are you, are you playing? <laughs> I'm just joking. Let me segue okay, okay. into a different direction. I I do. I would love to pick your brain on that more, but uh, we are slow on time. Would you agree with the principle that personal wit written testimony? carries more evidential weight than hearsay yes of course okay so wouldn't you agree that uh don't you understand our convictions of holding to scripture as the final authority because it has more evidentiary weight because it's written by personal eyewitness testimony whereas these oral traditions passed down through teachers are hearsay of what they heard someone said so it's he she said he said kind of game well so well, would you agree okay. that in terms of evidence that scripture seems to hold like a higher primacy in terms of its authority well as According i said at the beginning of my opening statement i think it's a false dichotomy to oppose scripture to tradition and i think that that's the debate that we orthodox get 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 corralled into all the time uh that one can't possibly complement the other and again we affirm that nothing in holy tradition, in other words, the oral unwritten teachings of the church, most of which by now have been written down, by the way, but most of those oral unwritten traditions don't contradict scripture. They expand in those areas where there is silence, where the scriptures are not very clear, for example, on how to baptize, on how to pray at the Holy Eucharist, at you, what Eucharist words here, to yeah. say, um, and things like that. Um, where, where scripture is silent on the details, holy tradition fills those things in. So if you can provide me with one example of, of one of our traditions that is contrary to the teaching of scripture, I would love to hear what you think it is. But if you've truly examined what the Orthodox Church holds to as a definition of scripture, uh, uh, of tradition, and so forth, I don't think you would find anything that would uh, fall into that category. On the other hand, because there is a, a, a silence on certain things, you have, as a result of the Reformation, a huge disparity that has led to schism amongst all the Reformation uh, churches, none of them in communion with one another at this point, all teaching very, very different things from high church Anglicanism to low church Baptist to whatever. And everybody's saying that you know, we're right because we have the Holy Spirit and we understand what's going on, uh, and you guys don't, nah, nah, nah that you've got chaos in the reformed tradition because nobody knows what to do about the silences the the gaps in what's being taught in the scriptures regarding very specific dogma this was one of the big problems in the reformation you know luther calvin and zwingli for example they all believed in the ever virginity of mary you guys don't right. now but they did then. That's actually false. Now, which, by that's, the way. That's, that's, that's not true. That, that's actually not true. It's uh, there's several Lutherans in the Missouri Senate who hold to the perpetual Virginia Mary. Well, it's in our. It's exactly in our. I'm talking about confession. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'm yeah. sorry. Well, we for us we don't think that's a fundamental article of faith, but let no. I let me just get I back get to. That. Yeah. So. In terms of the questioning here, so you're basically saying the Orthodox object to the idea of pitting scripture against tradition. Is that is that a correct uh, uh, sum of what your statement was earlier? 
That would be correct. Okay. Yes. Wouldn't Scripture you agree though that? In, wouldn't you agree that there are, there is a justifiable reason to test alleged oral traditions by what's already we already know is taught by a earlier source that's inscripturated. For example, the famous one that is brought up all the time is in Matthew 15, where Jesus has a discussion with the Pharisees where they're justifying the Korban rule. Now, what's interesting about this uh, rule is that it's recorded later in the Babylonian Talmud uh, by uh, you know the Jewish leaders at the time that this was a tradition passed down by Moses, meaning they believed it had a divine uh, origin. And so from their perspectives, it's completely wrong to pit scripture against the Korban rule. In fact, oral Torah interprets the scriptures. So wouldn't you agree, though, that by following Jesus's principle of we are allowed to test alleged divine traditions from scripture because Jesus says this contradicts, you know, the command to honor your father and your mother, that we as Protestants are able to basically hold scripture as the functionally highest authority by being able to test anything that is alleged to be by an apostle that's not in scripture. Luther, well, do you want to one of the challenges, one? Tony, is that the the scriptures don't you so you're 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 making that argument saying this is why we need to hold it as the final authority, but the scriptures don't say that. So when you when you compare the situation with the Pharisees, right, we don't deny Father uh, uh, Jonathan and I would say like, yeah, there is traditions of men and it, they are condemned in scripture. That is, that is clear. You'll find it there. And sometimes the, the issue at hand is people see tradition in the scriptures and think all tradition is bad. Maybe it's because how the NIV is translated and, and, and the way that it manipulates the text and, and other things like that. But the word, the word for tradition, the Greek word, you know, I might be pronouncing it wrong. Paradox, it, it's used positively and negatively right and so we can't just say oh because there is man-made traditions therefore all traditions are bad because we can find in the scripture where there's a po positive affirmation of traditions okay um i guess it doesn't really answer my question it, it's more of an epistemological uh, epistemological question of how do you know something's a divine tradition or a tradition of man because it seems the criteria jesus sets forth is that you know it's a tradition of man if it you, if it contradicts scripture, right? But if that's true, then that means that we're able to, before accepting any oral tradition, test to see if it contradicts scripture or not. Which means, from a functional standpoint, sola scriptura does have the final authority because we have to test everything to see if it contradicts or not. Wouldn't well, you again, agree that that's an case? assumption that that oral tradition would contradict uh, uh, right. uh, scripture? And again, we would make the contention that it does not. I'm not saying that. I'm just yeah. saying from a functional standpoint of testing so, things to see if they're true. How would you know? It, yeah. it, so, it, it would seem that just from a purely finding what's true or not, my, my first and foremost authority to test if anything's true is the scriptures. So it okay, might not be true. Tony's but, saying really quick. Uh, because I, I, I agree understand. on that. Yeah, because because I think what I, Tony's saying. Uh, sorry, you can go. Go ahead, Kim. I'm sorry, it's your time. No, no. I was just gonna say. I think what Tony is saying, he's not necessarily making the claim the traditions of men, you know, contradicts you know scripture necessarily. I mean, our entire opening statement was laying out various senses in which they don't. I think he's just saying that from an epistemic vantage point, right? Whether they contradict it or not, Scripture would have supremacy, uh, and, and that that I think is his argument. So it, it doesn't really touch on the question of whether uh, you know a tradition you know contradicts uh, you know uh, the written word because I would say sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, and, and by tradition here, I don't necessarily for this context mean you know, what we're debating about whether there's, you know, traditions on, say, the invocation of the saints or the uh, the uh, veneration of icons, which is what we were dealing with in our opening. It wasn't the use of images, which we grant, but the veneration of icons being a late development. Yeah. But, but yeah, like, that's basically what I think Tony's trying to say. I, I realize that this is the cross-examination that I just gave an explanation, so I apologize. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. This is why um, I brought Cameron on, because he's the smarter of the two of us so uh 
<laughs> wrong just on that. Wrong disagree. Very smart. I did. I did have but, one question. I really wanted to ask you guys. Um, well, do you want? Do you, you want us to? Oh, oh sorry. Do, go do ahead. you still want us? Do you still want us to respond to that question, or you want to? You want to move on to your new question? You want us to well, respond you, back to you, I guess. I guess just to put it in a simple form, wouldn't you agree after Cameron's explanation that from a functional standpoint, Scripture actually does have the highest authority since it tests everything else? No, no, no. That that's actually what we're actually pushing back against. So, so to answer your question, right? So in Saint Vincent of Lorenz, I know you guys quoted him in your opener. That is something that would, in short, you know, because I, I don't have it in front of me. Um, but definitely pull it up that all what was believed everywhere by all right there's there needs to be this this passing down this continuity in the faith and that's kind of how we judge what has been received from the church right so he he talks about saint vince of Lorenz talks about well what do we what do we do you know you have the nestorians believe this way you have you know arians believe in another way you have all all these different people that held to heresies and the idea is when we talk about the consensus of the church and what has been held, we're not talking about one person, we're not talking about someone being infallible, but the consensus of the church, we see that this has been believed, accepted by all. If you go to Thessaloniki, you know, uh, Thessaloniki, you go over there to Jerusalem, if you go to, you know, you know, some parts of, of, of Africa and whatnot, we see that the same faith with no cell phone, no Wi-Fi, no, you know, no held right the same beliefs and practices saint vincent Lorraine kind of gives us this standing ground this is what we as orthodox believe there's no way that we can all be able to have hold to something like that without not with you know what i'm saying with everybody being in different locations and 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 and, and having different customs and, and traditions that's the spirit of god moving through his church because the church is one it's holy and it's catholic and it's apostolic but I, yeah, I, I mean, this is Crocs exam, so I'm not going to respond to that right now. But uh, at least I would ask one question, follow up question with that. Wouldn't you agree that that rule of Vincent should apply to the apostles? Because they're the founders and the most authoritative members of the church. Uh, uh, about right. we know what's true if everyone everywhere at all times and all places is held to these same things. Wouldn't you agree that that has oh. to apply to the apostles too? Well, it, it, it depends. I mean, Irenaeus said that Jesus started his ministry when he's in his 50s. He's the only one who ever taught that. And clearly he was wrong about that. So it, it's again, this goes back to the idea that that church fathers are not infallible, which doesn't mean therefore, which does not mean, therefore, that everything they say is right and true and so forth. But when it comes to uh, the, the various apostolic teachings of salvation, ecclesiology, soteriology, things like that, there's going to be a very, very uh, wide general consensus that, that as Luther pointed out from Carthage to Jerusalem to Athens to Thessaloniki to Rome to wherever, there's going to be a very, very uh, wide true consensus on what everybody was taught by whoever they were taught it by. And therefore, there's going to be that, um, that, that unanimity of, of, of mind in the Holy Spirit that's going to allow uh, doctrine to be rightly taught because everybody was taught the same thing. Maybe not the details essentially, and I give the example of Irenaeus, and there are other examples. But generally speaking, when it comes to the, the issues of, of apostolic teaching, salvific issues, they're going to be correct. Yeah. So I did have one last question. Can... Oh, good. You go ahead, Cameron. Go ahead. No, I was just going to ask really quick. Uh, do, do you not see how like the, the citation of Irenaeus there actually, in a sense, proves Tony's point about the uh, transmission of information because Irenaeus in Against Heresies says that he got that tradition from people who knew John, right? And of course, he tries to justify it from the scriptures. He says, you know, that passage that says, are you not yet like 50 years old, which implies that he's in his 40s. But his main argument is tradition. So you, you see how that could prove Tony's point there. But, no, not but, at all. But there's no, I, I don't see there's... that. Go ahead, Luther. Yeah, yeah and I was just going to say quickly, I know the time's up. There's a couple of options. Um I recommend there's there's an orthodox apologist that actually knocks this out but you're familiar that Irenaeus believed in the re recapitulation right and so there's this yes. idea where one there could have been either a, a, a an error writing error right two it could have been in him trying to describe our our understanding of salvation 
And three, he could have just been blatantly wrong, right? And we and we accept that because we understand there's copies being made. There could be errors. So so we wouldn't dogmatically say because like I said, like Father said, it's not like this is this is why teaching consensus in the same way that we we hold to you know uh, the Theotokos and 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 all that the the church has said about her. So I think that should be taken into consideration when we when we bring up someone like uh, Irenaeus and that that want that error. Sure. Yeah, that's, I think, I think we're good. Uh, yep, that's time right there. All right, Luther and Father Jonathan, you guys are up for your 20 minute cross examination of Tony and Cameron. All right. Luther, go ahead. Let me roll. Okay. okay. Roll. All right. Is, um, so you guys kind of answered this earlier, but but just make sure is, is the church infallible? Uh, we would say that the church is indefectible. That means it will not finally fall in there. But that does not mean that the church of any given age is infallible. And so I would I would use as an analogy of this, it would be like the church in the middle of a council, right, where during the middle of the council, the church can come up with all sorts of like weird arguments. Right. But like the final, you know, end of the church, the, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And by church here, we, we mean the congregation of all the called. And that isn't a strictly invisible thing. I mean, it's. It, it, it is physical insofar as the church is instantiated in history and has certain marks whereby it's recognized. But yeah, that but our our, our contention is that the church is not infallible. But OK, the church is not infallible. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm tracking with you. So but the Lutherans do believe that they are the visible church on earth, that they are the we church. We believe that our that, that the Lutheran church holds to the foundational doctrines of Christian faith. Uh, we, we have a, a foundational doctrine. There's two sets of foundational doctrines. Uh, one are primary fundamental articles and the other are secondary fundamental. A uh, primary fundamental would be things like we all probably agree on to some extent, like, you know, the, uh, you know, two natures of Christ, you know, the Trinity, uh, justification by faith, not necessarily justification by faith alone, right? Those sorts of ideas. Uh, secondary fundamentals would, would be things like, you know, the, the correct doctrine of the sacraments, which relates to salvation, the justification by faith alone, you know, the, the exclusive clause, you know, excluding merits from our works and that sort of thing. So, so answering your question, we would say that the Lutheran church on earth uh, is the true visible church. That is to say it upholds the fundamental articles. That isn't to say that other churches can't be called churches, you know, uh, we would say that any entity which preaches the word and administers the sacraments is a church, but the true church is that which rightly preaches the word and rightly administers the sacraments. And that involves, you know, the correct doctrine of the sacraments and the correct doctrine of scripture. Is the book of Concord infallible? We would say the book of Concord is a correct exposition of the infallible scriptures. But is it infallible? No. Okay. We would say that cool. we, you can say it's infallible per accident, which is to say that the teachings contained in it, in reference to the scriptures, the things signified in it, are infallible. But the Book of Concord, so, as a human document, has probable authority, and that probable authority becomes infallible authority only insofar as it is preaching to us what is clearly revealed in the Word of God. But, but, but so, so I just want to be clear. Is it, so you said no, and then you kind of gave a, a, a back. Is it infallible? Yes. I, or no? I would say that per se, no, per accident, in a sense, per accident means that which is not essential to the thing, but which, you know, obtains from without. Right. right? So yeah. that the book of Concord is not infallible in the sense that that Holy Scripture is. Yeah. To back up Cameron on that. Building, the same well, yeah, the, the back of Cameron has the same thing with, like, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Tony. Well, well to back up Cameron, that's, it's basically the same thing with preaching from the pulpit. Uh, if the, when the minister is faithfully preaching what's on the page, then it is in substance infallible, like, as to the thing signified, right? He's preaching the word of God, so the word of God's infallible if he's saying it accurately, it's infallible. But that doesn't mean the preaching no, I mean, in about, of itself is What's that? I'm talking about the, the Book of Concord. Yeah, I'm just yeah, saying I mean, the same the same idea applies. 
it would also be how we read what happens in church councils, right? Where church councils, like the, the Council of Nicaea, is a correct exposition of the Word of God. And it has per accidents infallibility because, you know, it is resting on sure, you know, scriptural warrant. But we would say that substantially speaking, only the scriptures are totally in simpliciter infallible. Simpliciter meaning, you know, without qualification. All these Latin words. Oh, my goodness. OK. Yeah, so, so you're not you're <laughs> not sure if it's infallible or not, is what you're saying. No, I, I think I provided my answer there. I, it is not yeah. infallible substantially. OK. OK. I have um, a question for you guys. Oh, Luther, sure. go ahead. No, go ahead, Father. I, I have a question for both you guys. Um, first an observation, then, then a question. It's very clear to me that we have a very, very different ecclesiology, which then very, very directly comes to bear on how we look at scripture and things like that. We look at the church as the body of Christ, which scripture, I think you would agree, makes very clear. And let me ask either Tony or Cameron, would you agree that the, the church is the body of Christ? We would. But there's two okay, different which, centers in which the word agree, church is not an in institution. The We're talking about something that is real and organic and living and so forth. Yeah. Can, can I can I provide a qualification? I would say that the church Catholic uh, is the body of Christ simpliciter. That would be the collection of all those who uh, persevere, well, not perseveringly, but that who lean on uh, Christ's vicarious atonement. But there's also individual churches and in individual churches and even the collection of individual churches, there are people who aren't in the church, but you know, they are mingled with the church. And so that, that does affect our uh, position on how uh, the church can err or not err. Okay. Um, d does the Lutheran church accept the council of Nicaea? We, we do because we see it as a true and right exposition of the scriptural text. Okay, then I, a couple questions that, that hopefully ties all this together. Number one, the, the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Constantinople, uh, the, the second ecumenical council, which, as I understand, the Lutheran Church also accepts, declared that the church is one holy Catholic and apostolic. If the church is one, how can there be a church or how can there be churches which believe and teach radically different things about salvation? Yeah, so I would say there's two senses in which the word church are used. Uh, one sense is to say those bodies who hold to the fundamental principles of Christianity and who preach a message. Whoa, whoa, wait, wait, Cameron, hold on one second. Of, who determines sure. what's fundamental? Who determines what's I would say the scriptures themselves do. The, the, the things that pertain to saving faith are revealed in the scriptures to be apprehended. And then there's some things that you can infer that that pertain to that in a uh, conservative way. So there's generative articles. Generative articles are those which directly pertain to faith. And then there's conservative articles which sustain faith. And these would be things like the sacraments, which we would say, you know, uh, seal and uh, create faith and, you know, those who use them rightly. OK, all right. Let, let, let's get a little bit more specific. Jesus said, in John chapter six, I believe, unless you eat the flesh of the son of God and drink his blood, you have no life in him. So unless yeah. someone believes that Holy Communion is, wait, wait, hold, a second, hold a second, let me ask my question. Sure. And if, if Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, unless you accept the body and blood, of the, uh, accept the Holy Eucharist to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ himself, if you do not hold to that teaching, therefore you have no life in him, isn't that a rather salvific proposition? And furthermore, since churches like the Reformed Church don't believe this, can you call them a church? Oh, I, again, what I said is that they are a church with rever reservation. They wouldn't necessarily be a true church, but they would have true members. And so by synecdoche, they would be members of the church. But, but in response to John 6, uh, the Lutheran tradition is generally denied that John 6 is actually a Eucharistic passage. We would say this is about the spiritual eating of faith. Now, if you want to imply, you know, apply a a fortiori reasoning and say that, you know, if the spiritual eating of faith is sealed by the word, then how much greater will it be sealed by the true body and substantially present body of Christ in the Eucharist? 
uh, then, you know, I, I'm fine saying that. But but yeah, I would say that like the the reading of John six that is most uh, defensible is that this refers to the spiritual eating. And this has uh, all sorts of defenders in church history, like Origen, like Augustine. Uh, and several okay, others. Of course, a in a, in a a we don't look Cyril, at what he Cyril said I understand the origin. Sorry. Okay, Sam, can we ask you a question? So let, let's 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 talk about the canon a little bit. How do you know? How do you know the scriptures? How do you know what is contained in the scriptures? Yeah, so I would say the church is a ministerial cause which delivers us the scriptures, and then the scriptures have certain notes, things like, you know, the uh, beauty and grandeur that, that I would say uh, are objectively uh, present to all who can look at them rightly. And I would say that this is actually consonant with what several Orthodox theologians say about uh, the, the scriptural notes. Uh, Philaret of Moscow and his catechism list, you know, things like, you know, the grandness of the commandments, the uh, you know unity of the message, the simplicity of the speech, things like that. Played in the second, also has a good list in his book, and so I would say how do you that know we Hebrew? can know these. We, we can know, know the, the scriptures are divine from their their qualities. Now, how epistemically they got to us? That's a different question. I would say that epistemically they get to us because the church protects the canon. But I would also say that, like what you said about the canon earlier and these conflicting, you know, books, I would say that that the the basic idea that the church had about these ecclesiastical books and the apocrypha is, you know, actually much different than you think. I think there's books that are, uh, you know, permitted to be read, but I would say that they're not canonical in the same sense that the uh, proto canon would be. Sure. Oh, sorry, that's sure. That, we'll back to. Yeah, let me let me get off Go the ahead, canon for just a minute because I wanted to ask one or two more questions when we were talking about John six and, and the first ecumenical council and so forth. Um, you do realize that almost all the apostolic fathers who talk about the Holy Eucharist declare that what they were taught was, was that it was the very body and blood of Jesus Christ Himself. Are you aware of this? I, I mean, we we believe in the real presence of Christ. We just think that the seed of doctrine. That's not what I'm asking, exactly. man. Are, do you realize that the early apostolic fathers clearly taught? Irenaeus is one of the, not Irenaeus, excuse me. Ignatius very clearly says, for example, that what we were taught. In other words, he says it. What we were taught, what was passed on to us, is that the Holy Eucharist is indeed the very body and blood of Christ. Are you aware Amen. of the apostolic teaching, for example? on John 6 and the Holy Eucharist. Uh, we, we deny that there is an apostolic teaching as to the correct exposition of John 6. Uh, we would say okay, that... you deny that it. That's we, fine. All right. All right. You, you deny yeah. it. That's fine. Let me ask well, you well, no, question. No, but you're reading this case. as saying that we're denying the, the uh, body and blood of Christ in the Holy Eucharist, which if you know anything about Lutheranism, that is not something we deny. No, no, Cameron, I'm not denying it. I, I know what the Lutheran Church teaches about that, and I'm glad to hear that they do. There's just a disconnect between what the early church taught from what they received from the apostles, and I was talking about that, and Luther has been talking about, our Luther has been talking about that in some of our statements. But let me ask you about something else. The Lutheran Church, as I understand it, confesses liturgically the Nicene Creed. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Now, I want to ask you something. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Stop. No, no further addition. You say in the Nicene Creed, like the Roman Catholics do, the interpolation that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. If you hold to a position of sola scriptura, then, isn't that inconsistent with what Jesus himself said in the Gospel according to St. John? Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, there's two believe? things. One, as, as you guys said about holy tradition, there can be things that are absent, that are built on and implied by good and necessary consequence elsewhere. So, but, but what yeah. I would say about, about John, uh, you know, uh, sorry, the, the uh, filioque clause, uh, what, what we argue is that you can infer it on the basis of other passages, and just because the Spirit proceeds from the Father, it doesn't mean that the Spirit doesn't proceed from the Son. We we apply something called the Rahner's Rule a lot of times to explain how the filioque makes sense, that the undivided acts of the Trinity are undivided, right? And so the Cam, sending of the Spirit by the Son would be an example of this. 
Cam, can, can I jump in? So you, you, you said scripture is the final authority and Father is asking you a direct question. If you hold to Sola Scriptura, I understand you're using some, some, some rule or logic to say, hey, we could kind of hold to it, but we want to see where in scripture can we find it since you hold to Sola Scriptura. Yeah, I, I, and I said it's implied by good and necessary consequence. Where? That is something that is entered into. Uh, I, I mentioned that these passages that refer to the uh, spirit being, I, I'm, yeah, th these passages that refer to the spirit I just being one. I, I'm, I'm laying it out. Uh, the, these passages in Acts two, for instance, which say that the uh, son sends the spirit. The word proceed here is actually rather vague. It could just mean that the spirit is sent by the father. I mean, that's a valid reading. And so the fact that the son is sent, uh, I would say is, you know, sorry, the, the, the uh, son sends the spirit as evidence of some hypostatic relations. But in any event, I, I think that like this, this argument uh, confuses a few things because the main reason why the filioque popped up in the West, uh, it had secondarily to do with exegetical reasons, but the primary reason was this, this uh, argument that Boethius and some other people have that, that the uh, hypostatic relations of the Trinity require relations of opposition. So you need something like the filioque to make that work. And I would that's say there's true. leeway in how you were came up in, in, No, 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 no. Wait a minute now. It came up in Toledo in the sixth century to combat nascent Arianism. That's it. No, I, it, I agree it, it with that. On. I agree the, with that. The Pope's denied it. The Pope's denied it. The Pope's denied it. But Charlemagne put it through because he wanted to have something in opposition to the Greek East. There, there, but but see, here's the thing with the filioque. The, 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 okay. The Lord clearly said the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. You're saying that word is vague. The Greeks would disagree, and that's their language. But the point is there's a difference between the Spirit proceeding from the Father and Jesus sending the Spirit. Proceeding and sending are two different actions, and you cannot confuse the two. The source of origin of the Spirit is the Father, just as he is the source of origin of the Son. But the Spirit is sent by Jesus wherever Jesus sends the Spirit to make sure that we have that, that method of understanding that he wants us to have. But to confuse procession and sending, those are two different actions. You, you can't confuse I, I them and you're doing I didn't confuse the two, actually. I, I said that the yeah, I, have a, I, have a quick, I have a quick question because our, our time is rolling. Um, so I know that you guys hold the Sola Scriptura, and we know in John 17 that Jesus prays that we would be one just as him and the Father are one, right? He's praying for the unity of the church. And now so... Aside from all the denominations we could talk about that hold the Sola Scriptura, um, within the Lutheran tradition, you have um, LCMS and Wells that almost look identical. You guys have the same creeds and same confessions you hold to. So Sola Scriptura is the sole fallible rule of faith. Why is it that you guys holding the same confessions do not commune with one another and will not partake you, in each other's church? You would have to ask them that. I, I think that bad applications of fundamental and non-fundamental articles is just a, a fact that exists in the church. And I think even from your perspective, you could say that there's some unfortunate divides that exist, which shouldn't come to the, uh, you know, you know, uh, the degree of being church breaking issues. But for some reason, they are viewed that way. Yeah, like the but, Passover, but it's, for example. Still, the, the, but it's still, the we're still, still but we still would. But you guys don't partake of the same cup, yet you guys express the same faith. Yeah, and I would say that that is not for lack of trying on the LCMS's part. I would just say Wells is wrong there. Okay. Uh, so I, so I, earlier... I want... Go ahead, Father. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So earlier you guys said that the church is not infallible, right? That That's what you guys yes, said. Even though you, you yes, guys gave me a special answer for for um uh as far as when i asked you about the book of concord you did say the church is not infallible that's what i heard but you guys are the true visible church on earth and so my my question to you is how is that consistent if how are you guys how if sola scriptura is the final authority it's supposed to point you to the truth it's the true rule of faith how is it that your church is not infallible uh, I, I, again, I would say what I said about the uh, Book of Concord, where I would say that the Book of Concord, insofar it is, as it is a correct exposition of the role of faith, 
can be said to be per accidents infallible. And so you could say the Lutheran church is per accidents infallible, but that doesn't but, but mean not. that the church is per se or substantially infallible. It, mean, it means that since the Lutheran church is echoing correctly the word of God, it's basically oh. as if God was speaking. That, that, so in that no, sense, we are you. speaking with God's authority. So that's why we are not in but, our of our ourselves as being you know infallible. What's that? With God's authority. How do, you, how do you know you're speaking with God's authority? Uh, I would say like, the, reform, the, why, the, the reform would think the same thing. The Jehovah Witnesses would think the same thing. So what what sets you guys apart? Like what makes I mean, Luther or I can't uh, ask you anything so correct? Yeah, I would say that we uh, correctly interpret the scriptures according to the means of interpretation, many of which we laid out in our opening statement. All yeah. right, guys, time has expired, and what a fantastic discussion you guys have had. And once again, the audience is loving it. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to transition to our closing remarks. Make sure all the audience audience out there, make sure you get your questions in, because once we start the q and I will not be saving any more questions. Now, that said, uh, Cameron and Tony, you guys are up for your closing remarks so uh let me bring you guys in and then i will start your time when you begin to speak it looked like you tried to start already so sure go ahead yeah and, uh, go ahead got it yeah so i i would thank our opponents for their thoughtful interaction with their argumentation i didn't mean to get as heated as it was uh you know that's my fault i pray for forgiveness there uh but you know i i think that uh, we are defending truth, and truth often uh, requires strong disagreements. So unfortunately, in this debate, uh, we are inclined to disagree with everything uh, our opponents just said. Uh, we, we kid, of course. In all seriousness, our opponents get a lot right about authority in the church. We rightly concur the fathers, the early liturgies, the councils, etc., all have probable authority. That is the authority of the superb practitioner. Those who dedicate their life to the elucidation of scripture and those who have experience rolling well are worthy of a double honor. As such, we will say this again. Sola Scriptura is not the position that the church has no other authorities. In fact, Sola Scriptura presupposes other authorities. For instance, reason and the validity of first principles. Nonetheless, none of these other authorities have like force in matters of dogma, although they might have similar force in matters of piety, as St. Basil says. With that said, has our position been successfully rebutted? I think not. We defend this, a few distinct claims in our opening. We claim scripture is clear enough to lead us to eternal life. Our opponents agree with the caveat that they are re referring to material sufficiency, not formal sufficiency. But do the scriptures presuppose the church in order to be understood? Certainly not. In fact, the scriptures judge true churches from false churches. The scriptures are an authority over the church, and both Jesus and the apostles presuppose the rational intelligibility of the scriptures and their dogmatic disputes. Uh, an example of this is actually uh, Acts 8, which we mentioned, uh, where I would say the, the signification wasn't clear, but the thing signified, sorry, rather, the signification was clear, but the thing signified by it wasn't. Jesus and the apostles even assumed the formal sufficiency of scripture to lead us to a deductively true logical consequences which we mentioned in Exodus 3 and Acts 15 and like passages. If that's true of logical consequences, how much true will it be of explicit passages? The scriptures give the church legitimate authority, especially in things indifferent, but they have no authority to form dogma apart from God's word. The church is the pillar and ground of all truth by firmly adhering to her foundation, holy scripture. We granted a lot to our opponents when it comes to tradition. Certain traditions are indeed necessary. We only deny late on biblical traditions are absolutely binding on the conscience. They can bind the conscience through probability, but never absolutely without the scriptures. Our opponents br brought a catena of patristic quotations to support their view. Uh, we revere the fathers and we yearn to hear their opinion on this most serious matter. Nonetheless, we must say our opponents have done a disservice to the earliest fathers by their quotations. So the one that we will address uh, that, that Luther actually brought up in his rebuttal is uh, St. Basil, uh, where he asserts that custom has like force in matters of piety. Well, for one, we don't deny the usefulness of custom, as Richard Hooker says, lest therefore the name of tradition should be offensive to any, considering how far but some it hath been and is abused, 
We mean by traditions ordinances made in the prime of the Christian religion, established with that authority, Christ hath left his church for matters indifferent. And in that consideration, where the requisite to be observed, till like authority see just and reasonable causes to alter them. So scripture and custom both have like force in matters of piety by virtue of having de facto authority, although the scriptures have ontological priority. As Bishop Stillingfeed argues, it has been argued that the form of St. Basil used was found in the scriptures. He answers that the equivalent is there found and that there are some things received by tradition which have the same force towards piety. And if we take away all unwritten customs, we shall do wrong to the gospel and leave a bare name to the public preaching. His business is to show that the greater solemnity of Christian worship, several customs were observed in the church, which are not to be found in scripture. So Basel is making an ad hominem argument. He is working from premises, his opponents grant, and he is reverting their assumptions against them. That's also what Irenaeus is doing and against heresies, by the way. He is using uh, the traditional assumptions of the Gnostics by appealing to a mo much more sounder and fundamental tradition. As such, he is not denying Sola Scriptura, since this is the same Basel who says whatsoever is not delivered without scripture proof is sin, we should be wary of any attempt to pit Basel against Basel. But we do not have to wait and hear what Basel actually meant. In his concerning faith, he tells us this move was strictly polemical. I thought it appropriate to the specific nature of the impiety sown by the devil, and I should check or confute, that I should check or confute uh, the blasphemy which were brought forward by the opposing sides. And by this, I was imitating the example of my predecessors. And in many cases, these were not written down, yet they were not out of harmony with sound scripture teaching. In fact, the apostle was not above using even pagan utterances which were congruent with his sp special purpose. I only write, I only read Basel here to say that when our opponents accuse us of taking the fathers out of context, I think that we should really look at what they say. I agree, we should look at the fathers. So uh, our opponents focus on the supremacy of the church. They claim the scriptures are a churchly book, which we agree on, but God inspired scripture for humanity and its efficacy and authority holds men accountable both within and outside the boundaries of our ecclesi ecclesiastical bodies. The scriptures are a complete and intelligible rule of faith, not too difficult to grasp, nor beyond their reach. This church did not create the word of God, God did. Yet he did so through members of the church who he moved to write inspired utterances. He gifted the church with his covenant terms on the pages of Holy Writ. We learn about the threatenings of the law and the promised mercy in the gospel. And we adjust our life according to faith, hope, and love, which the scriptures beget and furnish through the spirit. For the law of God is perfect, a lamp exuding light. If that's true of the law, how much more will be true of the gospel? The scriptures are profitable and capable of leading us to every good work and as such life eternal. We rest assured that God will lead us into eternal life through his clear word and wonderful word. He has not spoken vaguely or abstractly. We don't rely on private judgment necessarily. We rely on God's uh, clear word, which tells us what we are to believe and left un undone. Uh, our conscience is bound by the word of God. And uh, private judgment, I would say, is the property of every Christian uh, insofar as God uh, has revealed a word to be believed. Uh, he has not spoken vaguely or abstractly. He has spoken to us and for us, and he will come again to save those who adhere to its message and faith. And we, we uh, uh, agree with the fathers. We love them. We revere them. But at the end of the day, the scriptures are the sole infallible rule of faith, and we don't think our opponents have rebutted our position. And with that, we close our case. All right. Thank you so much for your closing remarks. All right, uh, Mr. Luther Menard and Father Jonathan Ovenoff, you guys are up for your seven-minute closing statement. Father. To be charitable, sola scriptura could be a sincere and innocent attempt by anyone reading the scriptures to understand original meaning and intent, much like constitutionalists on the Supreme Court. But this then means the average sola scriptura believing Protestant thinks his interpretation is right and everyone who disagrees or differs is wrong. Indeed, they would have to be for how else can the Holy Spirit inspire people to come to vastly different conclusions. Which books are inspired requires God to reveal that because the Bible itself does not make that list clear. That revelation is not found in scripture. It is found in the history and tradition of the church and within the consensus of the early church fathers and holy tradition. 
All of Jesus' writings were not written down during the time of his life and ministry, and many of the aforementioned examples clearly demonstrate that. Ditto the oral preaching of the apostles. Um, Protestants have used sola scriptura to come to vastly different conclusions on biblical teachings. And we would ask, how is that possible? Who's right? When and how? What is the purpose of having an infallible Bible if you don't have an infallible Bible teacher, which Lutherans would say doesn't exist? Protestants say they don't want the interpretations of the early church fathers guiding them. Cam may say that, and Tony and some Lutherans may say that, but Protestants in general would say they don't want the interpretations of the early church fathers guiding them, but they will clearly and readily accept the interpretations of a James White, a John Armstrong, a Billy Graham, and many others as they are the new church fathers for Protestants who've just exchanged the very guides and interpreters who knew and learned from the apostles themselves. Many prominent non-denominational churches today would consider Martin Luther a heretic or at least misguided because he stood for for the union of the real blood of Christ, the ever virginity of Mary, and the intercession of saints. But Luther also held that New Testament books should be graded, and that some were more inspired than others. He gave secondary rank to Hebrews, James, Jude, and Revelation, and actually wanted James taken out of the existing canon and tore out many of the books of the Old Testament that had been part of the Septuagint, which the church had been using for 1,500 years. He himself, Martin Luther, did not practice sola scriptura. He had the arrogance and audacity to think he could edit the Bible, and he did. Back in 1998, something interesting happened in the theological world. A LCMS ordained pastor who is considered one of the 20th century's leading and most prominent and most influential patristic scholars a man by the name of Yaroslav Pelikan converted to the Orthodox Church. And one of the things that he reminded his readers and followers is the following. Tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living because tradition lives in conversation with the past. That many of our Protestant friends have forgotten. And so here's the basic problem with Sola Scriptura. Not everything can be explained via sola scriptura. We've tried to make that case. No clear description or teaching, for example, on worship, discrepancies on baptism, the right of Eucharistic celebration, and many other things uh, are a problem. So let me close with this. My time is, is almost over. In July of 1519, Martin Luther, a man with whom we're all familiar, founder of the Reformation, which would ultimately give rise to what we call the Protestant Church, and specifically the church named after himself, engaged in a debate with a famous Roman Catholic apologist named Johann Eck in Leipzig. When Eck argued that the fullness of the church lay with Rome under the authority of the Pope, Luther said something rather surprising. He invoked the Orthodox Church as an example of true Christianity for the past thousand years. The true church had not deviated from the early church, his famous statement from that time being that truth lies with the Greeks. And for once, we Orthodox agree with Martin Luther. And we encourage our esteemed debate partners here tonight to hearken to the wisdom of their founder and indeed see that truth lies with the Greeks, that is, the 2,000-year-old One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Thank you. Amen, amen. Um, I do want to say thank you to, to Cam and um, Tony. Really just had some really solid stuff and you generally really great guys. Well, we would credit to the Lutherans that they are the original Protestants. And so they do get a lot of things right. And, and we, we do kind of see that. We understand that. We respect that. Um, as far as with some of the things that we heard in tonight's debate, um, a lot of things are assumed but not justified, right? This idea that scripture is the final authority, we, we still don't see how that pars with what oral tradition. You look at Acts 15, you see how the church had authority to actually make decisions right through the moving of the holy spirit you see it throughout history in in the in the times of the early church there was not official i want to know in the first century second century third century who was who was walking around with the 66 book canon nobody was some people were illiterate at certain times catechumens had to depart at a certain part of the service there were certain things that not everybody knew there was hidden teachings people don't realize this and so to to make it seem like like Sola Scriptura was a thing that was happening. It's just blatantly false. It's 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 not historical, right? 
you look at what Father just mentioned about the Eucharistic prayers, which St. Justin Martyr even brings that up himself, right? And he, he, he talks about what worship looked like in, in, in his writings. There's no, there's no formulation of Eucharistic prayers in the scriptures. You don't, you don't find that. There's no, there's no exact explanation of how worship should, should be done in the scriptures. People have to assume that. Luther has to either borrow from what he's got from the Catholic Church, uh, new 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 sects today have to recreate whatever you know. You have the Joe witnesses with their their whatever the Kingdom Hall or whatever, and doing whatever they want because they have to figure it out, right? That's why you can go you can go to a Protestant church. They're doing it one way. Ten years later, they're doing something different because hey, we could do, we could do we could do whatever we want. We're not in continuity with the church, but the Apostolic the Orthodox Church is. It's been faithful, like Father. Uh, Father Jonathan mentioned. Also, we have family, right? These people, we know their names. Saint Fotini, we know the life of this Samaritan woman. What happened to her? How she used to share the faith. We, 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 we know about Justin Martyr, and I'm, I'm, of course, our Protestant friends are aware of them too. But the Orthodox Church has the fullness of the faith. It's truly beautiful. It truly has all that we need for godliness and to partake of the divine nature and to grow uh, in Christ likeness. All right. Thank you guys so much for those closing statements. So now we're jumping right into the Q&A. All right. I have some good questions here. And so we're going to see the question pop up at the bottom of the screen. Is Cameron there or is Cameron uh, hiding behind that screen? There he is. There he is. Sorry about All right. that. All right. No problem, man. No problem. All right. So we'll see the question pop up at the bottom of the screen. Uh, once again, if you need me to reread it, I will. It may be a little pixelated on your side. Uh, there it is. It's trying to come up. It's trying to get there. All my little yeah, graphics and stuff behaving themselves. All right. So the question is, thank you for the super chat. Dr. Bob, appreciate your support. Good to see you again. Father Jonathan, for both teams, is tradition God breathe? If so, why is tradition not in the Bible? If not, how can ontologically superior scripture be subject to bishops? Uh, Orthodox tradition team, if you guys want to tackle that one first. Well, well, tradition is not in the Bible. doesn't make any sense because St. Paul talks about yeah. it. Right. We would say, yeah, it is in the Bible. I'm not sure what Dr. Bob is saying. Um, if, if tradition, as, as we like to put it, is <laughs> life lived in the Holy Spirit within the, the, the body of Christ, then tradition does has, have a, certainly an element of itself that is God-breathed because it is the life of Christians united in Christ, uh, united to his body, to his very body, uh, making them Christians. Um, that means the, the life they live in the Holy Spirit, guided by the Holy Spirit within the life of the church, would mean that certain traditions and tradition within the church is God-breathed. So uh, those two statements, is, is tradition God-breathed to a point? Yes. Uh, it, why is tradition not in the Bible? We think it is, and I, I brought up scriptural passages that showed that. Yeah, I agree with Father. All right, Cameron and Tony. Yeah, I would say from our perspective, it depends on what you mean by tradition. I, I mentioned good and necessary consequences is something that are divinely inspired. Uh, but but yes, I would say that uh, certain customs, you know, uh, certain you know teachings, certain commentary traditions, these would not uh, be divinely inspired by us, and I, I don't think they would be viewed as divinely inspired by them. They would be viewed as superintended, right? But that doesn't necessarily equal that they are, you know, they honest us. All right. All right, so we have another question here. And this is a super chat. Thank you, King Danny, for the super chat. Thank you for the support. Appreciate it. How can we know that the canon of scripture is, if no book in the, is, period, if no book in the scripture gives us a list? I don't think he meant to put that period there. So I read it again. How can we know that the canon of scripture is if no book in the scripture gives us a list? Uh, yeah, Cameron and Tony, you guys want to tackle that one? Yeah, I'll answer that first. And I'll, I'll say that what we claim is that the scriptures from themselves uh, are authoritative and each book has marks of divinity. Now that is compatible with people failing to recognize what the canon is. And that's why there's ambiguity even within the Orthodox tradition, 
about exactly what the canon means. It could just mean that those books which are appointed to be read in church, it can just it can mean those which are authoritative for dogma. And so I would say that we infer uh, the the uh, scriptures uh, from uh, these five criteria with reference to the Principium, those inspired by the Spirit, with reference to the instrumental cause that is written by an apostle or prophet that can be determined historically to some extent, but the notes would also provide evidence for that. Uh, uh, the grandeur of the stuff I mentioned, with reference to material that it contains divine mysteries, with reference to the internal form that is God breathed utterances of the Spirit, with reference to the external form that is in Hebrew or Greek, with reference to the end goal or limit that it has the testimony of both the Jewish church, which is what it was willed for, and the early church. And I would say that these, these books in question have some, you know, the books that are in dispute between us, the ecclesiastical books we don't call them apocrypha we read them in the script in the church actually historically we did uh we would say that the debate here is about what use they have in dogmatic controversies it's only secondarily about uh what role uh inspiration has uh there it, it's more of an epistemic claim about how we form dogma than it is a uh claim about you know uh other things yeah, yeah, and to piggyback off Cameron, uh, I would just say that I think everyone, to an extent, and also you can look at uh, uh, evidence just based upon the fact of the historical right reliability of these documents. Did Jesus really rise from the dead? If he did, we should trust what he says. He gives his Holy Spirit to his disciples to be guided, to give us his word, etc. So if we know something's written by them, then it is protected by God and it's inerrant, etc. So if we find out who wrote them, if it's an apostolic man or if it's from an apostle, etc., then we can trust that it's uh, scripture, it's infallible, it's uh, guided by God. Uh, now, I would say everyone's kind of forced into this position because even in the Orthodox Church, how did the fathers of the council know that these books were part of the canon? If it's reception theory that you have to wait like X amount of years to figure out if it was canon or not, how did they know it was canon when they said it was canon? Well, they had to use different criterion to believe they had all these criterion that Cameron's listing. They believe these were written by apostles. So that's why they said these books were canonical. That's why they said these books were scripture. And so everyone is forced into this position. How did the fathers of the council know that these books were canon before they declared it? So I would, I mean, everyone's forced into this position. So that's I would say really quickly before, before, you know, uh, is that I would actually agree, even if the scriptures themselves uh, provided an index, you're stuck with the problem of saying, well, how is that book inspired? And I would have to say that, like, the, the index inspired. And I would say we recognize that if there is an inspired index by the specific notes in the book, uh, which Jesus that says that the sheep hear his voice. And I would say that uh, that's exactly uh, what, what believers do. By the way, mm -hmm. uh, if I can jump in here on this particular question and some of the things that have been saying, tradition plays a lot more into the formation of the canon than we're giving it credit for here. For example, how do we know Matthew wrote Matthew, Mark wrote Mark, and so forth? None of them are self-identified except John's gospel. And it's from tradition that we know who wrote what, including the epistle to the Hebrews and so forth. There are lots of examples of of uh, things in scripture that that certainly came to us through oral tradition and so forth. One of the more famous being <clears throat> uh, St. Paul quoting something Jesus said that's not found in any of the canonical gospels, none of them, nor in any of the <laughs> uncanonical gospels. Uh, when when St. Paul quotes Jesus as saying it is more blessed to, to give than to receive. You have a lot in the New Testament that relies on the old and a lot of the New Testament that relies on the old relies on the Septuagint. So there were traditions of the formation of the canon that uh, were, were active even back in that first century that had a lot to do with tradition and really not as much to do with councils later on. I mean, the lists were finalized at councils, but the lists were already being compiled by bishops in their various sees. All right. All right. All right. All right, just uh, give y'all a little heads up, man. I meant to tell you guys, uh, let's try to keep them responses a little shorter, man. I know we got a lot of information there. <laughs> Sorry so we about that. Through, it's all good. So we can apply to these questions. All right, so 
we got another one thank you chuck chuck for the question for the orthodox has sacred traditions been preserved as well as good as scripture if not why should we trust sacred scripture as much as we trust uh sacred tradition as much as we trust scripture I'm, I'm trying to read it, Marlon. Has sacred scripture been preserved as well as good as scripture? Is that what the first question is? Yes. And then he says, if not, why should we trust sacred scripture as much as we trust scripture? Sacred tradition as much as we uh, trust scripture. Well, well, the, to the question, has sacred tradition been preserved as well as or, or as good as scripture? I think you'd have to ask the question first, what traditions are we talking about? Again, St. Vincent of Lorraine, that which has been believed everywhere, always, and by all. And clearly there is a consensus on uh, all of the issues of, of salvific importance on ecclesiology, soteriology, things like that. Where we have contended scripture best steps in is when scripture is silent on the practical matters of what to do and how to do them. For example, I mean, there's, there's much more than just that. But so if the question is asked, has sacred scripture tradition been preserved as well as good as scripture as well or as good as scripture i don't know if i can answer that but it has certainly been preserved well over two thousand years yeah, yeah. there's a second there's question. also if not the, well we, we would say not so we wouldn't say not yeah yeah and and also it seems like there's a an assumption that just because something is written down because at the end of the day we don't have original the original manuscripts right we don't these are copies of copies, right? Of so, we're if we're being real, we're trusting the church, right? You there's there's a real re, there's a real sense in which you trust what the church has kept and preserved, whether it's unwritten or written down, because Paul said it himself, "Hold fast, hold fast to it," whether by uh, epistle or whether. So he taught them, and in I believe it's First John. Uh, Father may have quoted it earlier. He says. Um, they listen to us. The, Father, am I, am I getting that scripture right? Um, they that listen to us. Uh, can you, can you kind of help me with that one? I can't remember it. <laughs> it's in First John. I, I know what you're talking about. And right. at almost 11:30 at night, I'm having trouble remembering. Uh, yeah, but basically, but I John three three. Yeah. It, yeah, but but basically, there's this this idea, this concept that there's a living relationship, this living continuity that holds the faith down, right? In the same way. So hopefully that that's helpful. Yeah, I think this is actually a good question because, uh, or were we were able to respond to questions that are to specific people. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said anything. Yeah, you can respond to the question. Yep. Okay. I think this is a good question because I think the answer, if anyone's honest, would have to say sacred tradition isn't as preserved as well. Because you have all these different branches of the church, like the Oriental Orthodox, the Roman Catholics, the Coptics, and all these various other people that are claiming infallibility. We're guided by the Spirit. We have apostolic tradition, and they're all teaching completely contradictory things. Uh, the Orthodox do not believe in the infallibility of the Bishop of Rome, and yet they claim that, well, we're the true church guided by the Spirit. You have to trust us. So when I hear arguments from Luther and Father Jonathan that you just have to trust the Orthodox Church, that simply is you're just stuck in a middle zone. Like, well, do I trust this person who says he, the, he's infallible or this person that says he's infallible? So sacred tradition simply just isn't uh, preserved as well as scripture is. It, it's hard to uh, do uh, comparison and analysis with oral things, which is just a telephone game than it is with written documents, which you can check to see if there were scribal errors and stuff. So I think if anyone's honest with the uh, evidence, they would have to say scripture is much more preserved than sacred tradition is. I'm going to disagree with you, Tony. I, I oh, think okay. that, that, you know, <laughs> it depends on what you mean by tradition. <laughs> and I'll just end with that. Certain well, yeah. <laughs> after all, certain are not, yes, so. yes, yeah, that's... <laughs> Just want to keep keep harping at that. Man, we are not over actually, can. <laughs> we are not pitting scripture against tradition. We're pitting scripture against late unbiblical traditions that are not audio. All right, guys. Here's another question. This one's for Cameron and Tony. Uh, if a person holds the Sola Scriptura, how can they know what is scripture and what is not? Uh, we already answered that. All right. Yeah. So, well, we have some thoughts on that. I mean, 
And, and I think it's a great question by uh, Chris. Just this idea that like there, you, you, there's pretty much the, the categories get really slim. It's either you have an infallible, you know, infallible list, you know, prescribed by somebody or it's a fallible list. And it's just like, it's almost like we're denying the aspect that it was handed down by the church, by tradition. You know, I know that uh, we got some really well-crafted answer for, for, for how they know what the scriptures is, but, but does it, does it hold weight historically? And that's kind of some of the arguments we were bringing up earlier that I feel like we're not really addressed. Yeah. Can, can I, can I address that? Cause I didn't really provide an answer, yeah, you can. but, but what I'll say, I'll extend an olive branch is I actually think uh, our position on the criterion for Sola Scriptura actually explains how the Orthodox could, you know, justify uh, the existence of, you know, firm adherence to s- sacred scripture prior to any of these, you know, examples that you mentioned. And so I would say even today, I mean, that that would explain why you have these, uh, these, you know, uh, canonical lists, you know, and John of Damascus and Athanasius and, you know, Philaret of Moscow and some of these other people, which, you know, on the face of it, uh, have a Protestant Old Testament canon. And that, that would just be to say that, you know, the church has two criteria, and, you know, uh, over time they uh, applied these criteria, and, you know, some books they, you know, read in the church, even revelation for you guys would have doubtful canonicity, but you don't doubt it's inspired. So that, that would be a, another example of this. So I would say my criteria would, would provide an objective measure for you to even check and argue amongst yourselves, you know, about which books are canonical and which are not. Yep. Yeah, it's, especially because like St. Irenaeus, who we trust a lot in terms of authorship of the Gospels and stuff, as Father Jonathan was pointing out, I was like, well, you know, they the writers didn't necessarily say they were writing it. A lot of the information we do get from sources like Irenaeus of Lyons, but even he says things like, you know, he believed Shepherd of Hermes was canonical. So we do have we do have to use some critical thinking in terms of, you know, our analysis of the fathers on this issue. It's just we're just in that reality. That's just the reality of the situation. Right. Uh, and here's a question for Father Jonathan and Luther. Uh, doesn't tradition err from Scripture in asserting Mary as New Eve when the church born at a Pentecost is the New Eve, bride of Christ, the new Adam? Yeah, can, can I answer that? Uh, it's for the uh, Orthodox uh, first. No. <laughs> so after that, then you can jump in there. Sure. Well, you know what? I, I let Cam go, and then I'll just correct him after he's done. <laughs> no, I was actually just going to agree. I, I think that Irenaeus and some of these other early writers have a pious uh, New Eve theology, and I, I don't mind calling Mary the New Eve in a qualified sense. So so that, that would be why I, I don't have any issues with saying that the, uh, you know, a woman in Revelation, in a qualified sense, could be Mary. Uh, I, I don't mind saying that, although I would say it primarily refers to the church. So in, in Protestant theology, we have something that's called the literal sense and the compound sense. And the compound sense would be, you know, uh, close to what you guys refer to as the allegorical sense or the spiritual sense, right? It's an application of the literal sense to a new situation in order to edify people. Uh, and so uh, calling... Uh, you know, Mary the New Eve is not really a problem from my perspective. I have a pretty high Mariology as far as what I'm willing to admit and not admit. Well, when it comes to the specific question, um, does tradition err in asserting Mary as the New Eve? No, it does not. There's a implicit in this question is the statement that you can use the term one way, but not another. And I think that's a big mistake. Mary is called the new Eve because the old Eve, the original Eve, said no to God. God said, don't do this. And she violated that. And uh, we had a lot of problems that came into the world because of that. Mary, when approached by the Archangel Gabriel uh, and told what she was being approached for, uh, said, you know, amen, let it be to thy uh, servant uh, as you will. And so, whereas the old Eve said no to God, the new Eve said yes to God. And, and this is where the imagery comes from. So, no, I would say the tradition does not err from scripture um, in, in terms of this. Uh, I would disagree with Mario on that. All right, all right. 
And we have a super chat here, and this question is for uh, Tony and Cameron. Thank you for the super chat. Eric, appreciate the support. How would Protestants argue for the corruption of the body of Christ? They, would ha they have to impugn Christ to claim that his promises failed for a time. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I would just say that if you read Matthew 16, if you read some of these other texts about the spirit being led into all truth, uh, in one case, you know, this is referring to the indefectibility of the church. Uh, and that allows uh, errors, you know, even on fundamentals, but it means that the fundamentals of the faith are still present. And so we don't actually assert that the church ever fell away. You know, that isn't our argument. Uh, but we say that the church is, isn't infallible, and we don't think that these proof texts uh, prove infallibility. You know, John 14, you know, or 16 is another example of the Spirit, you know, leading the apostles into all truth. I would say they he led the apostles into all truth directly, and then the, you know, church into all truth indirectly through the scriptures of the apostles. So, uh, again, uh, I, I think that the church, you know, has always existed on earth. I think it's existed through, you know, uh, pious believers who rest on Christ in the hour of death. I think it exists through people who affirm uh, the gospel. I think it exists through through uh, baptized babies who I would say, you know, are given faith in the baptismal act. And so uh, really, I, I think the church has persisted throughout this period. And, you know, it's it's a straw man to say that Protestants are, you know, restorationists or something to that effect. That's a much different position. We're yeah, reforming yeah, the church. Right. We're not recreating it. Yeah, it's never been our position that uh, the church will ever finally fall or will ever fall away. Like, there's never going to be a true, like, you know, there's never going to be true saints of God on the earth at, at certain points of time. Like, no, we always contend that there are true uh, saints of God, that there's valid, visible congregations and everything. I would just say that these promises are also to every local congregation, like, God promises the guidance of his spirit to every single congregation because every single congregation, as Paul says, is uh, given every single thing they need to be the body of Christ in first Corinthians. And so every single local congregation is uh, just as much a body of Christ as any other local congregation or uh, assembly of people. They're also guided by the spirit, but no one would say local congregations can't err or even big groups of local congregations can't err. So, I mean, I, we all the, the promises really mean are that the church will never have a a, pos, a final apostasy. There's all the church will always exist. There's always going to be faithful members of the church. We see this in the Old Testament. You know, uh, I believe it was with Elijah, where there's only like seven thousand pe faithful people to God left. I mean, so there's always there's sometimes a righteous remnant in the time of the Arian crisis. There was seemingly more Arians than Orthodox Christians, but Ath, you know, Athanasius, is, uh, when he's making his argument against the Arians, he doesn't say it's not about how many numbers of people in the church are, but who holds to apostolic teaching that is the true member of the church. So there are times where the church is small. There's times where the church is big. Um, and that's pretty much just what our response to that would be. All right. And here's, an, here's another question for the Orthodox oh, team. Oh, oh, you guys didn't respond? Oh, shoot. Hey, hey, was, hey, hey. Yeah. All right. No problem. Yeah, you go ahead, go ahead, Luther. Problem. Okay. Um, well, um, and I appreciate I appreciate the question and what um, our brother shared. Now, the thing that we find a little problematic is just this idea. So, like, there's things that we're granting, and honestly, we we shouldn't have to we shouldn't grant it. Like, there's no justification, honestly, for the Lutheran Church, especially for the fact that they consider themselves a visible body, but it's almost like as if they're recognizing these other Protestant groups. And I don't want to, I don't want to speak for them. Maybe, maybe they're not saying that, but there is a real sense where that just doesn't seem to be consistent because truth is truth. And the Holy Spirit is going to guide the church into all truth. There can't be all different forms of truth. Like there, it just, that's not how truth works. There only could be one truth. And so if you have a you know the lutheran church who by the way it is not even united in their own communion themselves then how is it that they they're not a church that just came out of nowhere and were restored in the 16th century you know it just it just doesn't make sense logically first five centuries of the church where is the lutheran church i know that's anachronistic but where where do you see that 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 tapestry of 
oh, we can see Lutheran type theology to the church. They believe in two sacraments. If you look into the early church, they 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 held to you know chrismation. You know, there's you know pedal communion that Lutherans, to my knowledge, I'm not sure, don't practice. You know, you know, you know, uh, re, um, the, uh, praying to saints and all these other things that we could just go down the line that Lutherans will reject and many Protestants also will reject. And it's like, how do we ignore the practice of the fathers, but then quote those very same fathers to justify ourselves? We, if they're not, if they're not part of the same faith, but yet we use the same, the same scriptures that they use. Yet we're not a part of their church. We, 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 we quote them, but we don't hold the same faith as them. It's inconsistent. All right. And we have another super chat here. Thank you, Verbum, for the support. Appreciate it. All right, this question is for, for Luther and Father Jonathan. How are Luther and Father Jonathan defining Sola Scriptura? How does Luther know we do not have original manuscripts? <laughs> so two questions. So two questions oh there. Let's gosh. first deal with the first one. How are Luther and Father Jonathan defining Sola Scriptura? Let's deal with that one first. So so scriptor, um, according to what our 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 good Lutheran buddies over here said, is the sole to to put it in short, the sole infallible rule of faith um for you know for the church today is how he expressed it. And that's how, and they would also say that it's clear and you know perspicuous, but that's how we would understand soul scriptor, that it's the sole infallible rule of faith for uh, so infallible rule for faith and practice, you know, of some sort, which contains a lot of elements in it that obviously one needs to hold to. Well, Father, I don't know if you want to add anything. Well, no, no, I, I think that's fine. The, the, the second question, I find myself somewhat flummoxed. We don't have original manuscripts. We don't have any of Paul's original epistles. We don't have any of the Gospels written in the first century by Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. I'm not sure what the question is is meant to 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 imply but unless what the questioner is asking is what we have today descends from that that's true but we don't have the originally written letters and gospels none of those original manuscripts exist we don't know what they look like the earliest manuscripts we have that are extant that are that are that are all together date from the 4th century and we just have uh, fragments and so forth of, of stuff earlier than that. So we don't have original manuscripts means, means we don't have the real original ones. I hope that's clear to the person asking that question. All right, uh, Cameron, Tony, you got any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, you know, he, he was working with my definition. So I give him, you know, thumbs up on, yeah. on that one. Uh, <laughs> as far as the original manuscript question goes, yeah, I mean, we, we would uh, agree, you know, uh, I, I would say, you know, it's an open question within Lutheranism, whether you hold to, say, an ecclesiastical text position or, you know, a majority text or a, you know, uh, you know uh, critical text. Uh, all of those are open questions, but I would say that, like, uh, either way, uh, I think pretty much all Lutherans would say that uh, the substance of uh, what we have in, you know, our modern Bibles is, you know, what the apostles wrote. All right. And here's another question here. And this will probably be, probably have one more question after this one. All right. All right. So this is probably for Tony and Cameron. How does Sola Scriptura explain the historical fact that bishops and regional councils added and deleted books from their regional canon? Uh, I'm, I'm guessing he's referring to the canon of scripture here. And uh, yeah. I would just say, uh, you know, if, if you're referring to, you know, certain books that were read in church, I mean, that's actually fairly easy to explain. I would say the canon is used two ways in, in the fathers. Uh, sometimes it is used for that which can licitly be read in the church, regardless of inspiration. And that's why you can see Hermes and the Didache and some of these other books which generally speaking weren't views as inspired being called canonical. But then there's this other sense of canonical, which, uh, you know, Jerome and some other people use, which is that which can licitly be used to establish doctrine. And uh, in that sense, I would say, you know, uh, it's, uh, 
it, it's a much different question. I would say the Orthodox has the same, you know, uh, same position. I was reading, uh, I think it was uh, Michael Pomazansky or, uh, you know, uh, calls the uh, Deuterocanon, you know, or the ecclesiastical books an, an appendix to inspired scripture, which in a sense uh, implies that they are uh, functionally different in some ways. Now, that doesn't mean that they aren't useful and uh, confirming doctrine, but we deny that they can establish doctrine. All right. Uh, Father Jonathan and uh, Luther, you got anything? Well, uh, the, the whole idea that, that bishops were adding and deleting books just, just shows the kind of confusion and ambiguity that Scripture held at the time. There were a lot of things that were called Scripture. I mean, we can go through the New Testament alone. For example, in the epistle to Jude, when uh, Jude talks about, the author of the epistle, Jude, talks about Michael and Satan disputing over the body of Moses, that's not found anywhere in the current canonical Old Testament uh, and let's be expansive here and talk about the Septuagint as used in the uh, Orthodox Church. It is found in a book called The Assumption of Moses. And you can go through the, the New Testament and you can see these quotes about things that are found nowhere in the Old Testament. So one has to ask the question, what were they reading? But what was right. called scripture, quote unquote, back then was a very fluid, very loose kind of thing. I mean, you know, the it, it's very and that's, by the way. That's clear even from Scripture, where the Sadducees only read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, the Pharisees read the prophets, but the Sadducees didn't. The Essenes read something else. The, the, the Zealots read something else. And, of course, we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, what the Essenes read. We, we have found those Scriptures. Some of it uh, are what we would call canonical, and some are not. So... What was scripture back then? This would be a fascinating topic just to talk about, not debate, but just to talk about what was scripture back then was a very fluid, very loose kind of thing. And a lot of things were considered scripture that we today would think are edifying, perhaps, and worth reading. But, but when people got together and the bishops start asking each other, what are you reading? What are you reading? What are you reading? The consensus very clearly by the fourth century settled on what we have today. All right. All right. And this will be the last question of the evening here. Thank you, Noah, for the question. Uh, question for the Orthodox. Can you re-explain how exactly we, de we determine when a give a counsel is speaking authorita authoritatively and when it is not? Can you explain how exactly we... I'm trying to read that there. How We can determine um, when a give a counsel is speaking authoritatively exactly and when it is not. Okay. Well, I think it takes time uh, for people to see how the Holy Spirit is trying to speak through that counsel, uh, whether it is addressing error, whether it has been uh, authoritative in suppressing error, in addressing error, in calling people to repentance and so forth. The Holy Spirit, which each of us are supposed to have and possess, which is supposed to guide us into all truth, is one of the means by which we can understand this process. And as I said earlier, it's not instantaneous. It takes time for people to talk and to evaluate and weigh and pray and repent and all kinds of things to determine how authoritatively any particular council uh, is after it has convened. All right. Uh, Tony and Cameron. Can we... Yeah, I just think this is such a bizarre explanation. Forgive me for saying it that way, but... Like, if you have one or two people that are in the church who don't believe is ecumenical, then they get excommunicated. But they're also no, they said don't. to have well, the Holy well, Spirit. No, no, no. If, if, if you're talking about an existing ecumenical council, they may not be excommunicated. And, of course, that means something very specific to us and very different to the Roman Catholics. I just want to be very clear about that. Okay. They have to accept but the ecumenical would... council to become orthodox, though. You're right. Okay. So it, it's just... I guess it's just kind of strange of how exactly when we determine, okay, we've had enough people to say yes and amen to this council to say it's infallible. I mean, you're probably going to have some people in the church who didn't, that don't actually accept the council later on. But then since there's more people that accept it than don't accept it, then they decide it's ecumenical. But then you have to just say, well, the, since the vast majority accepted, then that means the other people didn't really, weren't really guided by the spirit. You have this really bizarre conundrum. And then, how do you justify that the Roman Catholics 
don't have ecumenical councils anymore. The Orthodox have to say they don't. And you just, you have this really big tug and pull that really just, you have so many problems, I think, with that explanation, in, in my opinion. All right. And this is my, the final my, question. No, no, I'm, I'm done. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say my thoughts are, you know, oh. developing on this question, so I have nothing to say. Okay. Um, I think I was just going to quickly say, I think uh, to Tony's trying to, you know, bringing up some good points to wrestle through. Um, as far as with councils, like, like I said, and that's why we kind of bring it, we kind of bring it back to Acts 15, trying to speak your language, which is the scriptures. So when the church accepts something, right, I mean, I'm sorry, when, when, when you have councils and, and bishops are, are sharing something. Now, if the church rejects it, you know, like I think Father brought earlier, the, the robbery council, like Orthodox people are very stubborn is what, what is said sometimes. And so there is, is, the faith was once delivered. There is this deposit of faith, right? So there is this understanding in the faith. It's, it's, it's what we would call like an Orthodox front of mind. And so just in short, like, that wouldn't necessarily like i know you brought up the roman catholics this that and the third well that split is a whole different kind of subject which by the way you know i'm i'm not sure how familiar you are with you know the orthodox stance on how that that split is about has gone about but that wouldn't that wouldn't take away from the fact that you know that councils are true and infallible and, and accepted by the church i mean as far as i'm concerned do the Lutherans have any councils, you know, and if they do have, I know you mentioned the Missouri Synod, do, do you, you guys wouldn't consider that infallible because you don't consider your church infallible. So, and at that case, like everything's up for grabs in Protestantism because they're the, the faith can be reformable. Things can change. It's not the faith once delivered. So I think it actually brings an issue on the Protestant. End. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't agree with your framing of that in any way whatsoever. I mean, you have people who disagree that reality exists. So you simply pausing, well, the Orthodox Church is infallible, so therefore I can know reality exists, would never convince a person who believes in Bolt's brain theorem, for example. It, it's like static. You, and, and, and to some extent, we have to just assume, like, there's no good reason for me to think the external world doesn't exist, right? Unless you give me a reason to think it doesn't then I am justified in believing it does exist, right? But it's I can't reliable. justify that by saying, you know, patriarch so-and-so tells me the external world exists because the external world existing presupposes he, him even saying that. So there are certain right. things that we just have to believe as foundational before we jump to the infallibility of the Orthodox Church. And that's that's right, our only be... contention. Right. That. We have to believe okay, that Jesus right. founded the Church okay. first before uh, we believe the Orthodox Church is all right, guys, we're going to go on to the next question. I got, I'm got, getting these super chats in as well, so let me uh, try to pile through these things. Try to let you guys go, man, but they keep sending them in. So, do Lutherans affirm creedal unity? And if they don't, what do they see as a value of creeds in the early church? Uh, we, we do affirm creedal unity. Uh, we would say that we affirm the... Uh, you know, various ecumenical creeds, we would say that we uh, affirm, you know, the uh, Book of Concord as being a creedal document. Uh, and so uh, we, we grant, I mean, the scripture itself has creeds. First Corinthians 15 is a creed. So we would say these are, you know, nice short ways of uh, saying the scripture analogy of faith. You know, uh, Tertullian and Irenaeus call these things, you know, the uh, rule of faith. And uh, we, we don't disagree. We would just say that these are, you know, uh, materially speaking, just uh, the foundational doctrines of the scriptures. All right. Uh, Luther, Father Jonathan. Father. On, on the specific issue of creedal unity. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I mean, and if they don't, do they see? Uh, if they don't, do what? The, do they see as uh, the value of creeds? What do they see as the, the value of creeds in the early church? So, well, I think it, it, what yeah. what you define as early church is, needs to be kind of said. But let, let, let's go to Nicaea, which which obviously defined a creed, which is still used today by you know a billion and a half people. Um, the Nicene Creed was formulated because there were many creeds out there 
and the church realized it needed to have one baptismal creed, one creed that could be read at baptism, that could be something every Christian could affirm. And, and of course, therefore, the value of having one creed, and of course, that creed would be sung at liturgy eventually, and not that far after it was formulated. Um, the value was that it expressed the unity of the church. And so while there were early creeds in the church, and people point to the Apostles' Creed and the, the Athanasian Creed and so forth, uh, which was around contemporary to the Nicene Creed, the fact of the matter is the church did have early creeds and early baptismal hymns and things like that, but saw the value of creating one that the entire church could recite, and that became the Nicene Creed in the 4th century. Yeah. And uh, to piggyback off what Father said real quick, in that same creed in Nicaea, I mean, we don't affirm that, you know, our good friends over here, well, it's not even specifically them, it's not targeted, but basically the Lutheran tradition or pretty much any kind of tradition that, um, you know, kind of, you know, has the filioque clause in there, which the creed cannot change, you know, we would say, how, how can they really affirm the creed, you know? How can we really affirm this idea that the church is one holy catholic and apostolic right and you know like it, it just it just wouldn't make sense so i mean that's what we would kind of say on that so yeah they affirm things like the book of concord or other things but the book of concord came centuries after right it's not affirmed any anywhere before it was created by lutheran scholars you know you have Melanchthon who who wrote the Osberg Confession, and you have scholars that came together with the Book of Concord. It's it's a it's a scho it's scholarship. That's that's really what you know Protestantism at its core is. It's it's a bunch of scholars, whereas the the church is full of saints. Not to say that um, not to say that there's no faithful people in other places. All right, we have. <laughs> I got two more super chats in here, but here's a here's a joke right here, and I think you guys are sort of get a chuckle out of it. Where do I get an Orthodox dog? All all of the shelters only have Wolfrens. <laughs> yeah, y'all think that's funny? <laughs> yeah, that's good. All right, man. Y'all ain't getting too much of a chuckle. Out. I thought it was pretty humorous, but there we go. <laughs> All right, so this question, how can you believe, thank you for the support once again, how can you believe in Sola Scriptura when we have interp interpolations of Scripture? Are the interpolations considered Scripture by Lutherans? Uh, yeah, so, so uh, you know, entering into that question, I think it's a problem for both of our positions that, uh, you know, uh, certain, you know, modern textual uh concerns, you know, uh, run up against, you know, traditionally uh, held beliefs about like the longer ending and things like that. But uh, I would say generally speaking, uh, you know, I think most of those are pretty defensible. Uh, so, so uh, you know, I would have uh, question marks on like the, uh, you know, uh, the first John 5, 7, for instance, but that's pretty much the only one I think you can't make a substantial argument for but but in any event i i'm okay saying that these are scriptures by way of synecdoche that is to say they are part of the whole which is to say uh you know of inspired scripture as they are handed down to us and that's why i think that the fathers often call all sorts of books which were part of their manuscript tradition uh scripture because by synecdoche uh by part to whole reasoning they were included in the whole complex of that which was delivered down, and so they can be called sacred by means of that unity. All right, uh, Luther and Father Jonathan. Well, I, I'd be curious to see what the questioner thinks of in in terms of interpolations. What what they think, what what they have in mind. I, I would like to hear more about the question because I think it's a little bit open ended. Um, so I, I really don't think I can comment more. All right. And this should be the last question of the evening. I know I said that like two times already, uh, but this should be the last one. Uh, according to textual scholars, the dates of the manuscripts are inclusive. Is that a question? That doesn't, I, I don't All understand right. what he's asking. Sort of a statement, but yeah. I don't know if you guys had anything to say anything about that or... Well, oh. 
Um, yeah, I, I know a little bit about, I, I think, what he's asking. None of the manuscripts that we have, although they can be dated to a particular century, like the Codex uh, Sinaiticus or Alexandrinus, for example, all of these can be dated to certain centuries, most of them, most of the earliest extant manuscripts to the fourth century, the 300s. But in terms of saying the dates uh, of manuscripts are inclusive, I'm not sure exactly what he's trying to say there. Uh, it, it could mean that, as I just said, the manuscript dates from the fourth century, but we don't know where the individual particular letters date from. They, they never really say. I mean, we can date Luke pretty accurate, not Luke, I'm sorry. We can date certain things in uh, some of the gospels and epistles to certain periods of time because they reference other historical people and so forth. That's not what's being talked about here. Um, so I, if you're talking about when Paul wrote Thessalonians or when James wrote his epistle or things like that, we don't have those dates. We have the best guess of, of biblical scholars on those things. All right, all right. Uh, anyone else? Uh, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. All right. Good stuff, guys. <laughs> All right, that was a bit long Q and A there, man. Q and A's ain't supposed to go that long, but I thank you guys for uh for staying in there, man. I know it's kind of late on the East Coast, so you guys are sort of mentally exhausted, tired physically and mentally. So I really do thank you guys. So uh, I'm going to let you guys go. You guys have any final words before we uh, before I shut this thing down? I am honored. Uh, appreciate uh, Tony. Appreciate Tony. The awesome people. Oh, sorry, yeah. Father. Go ahead. No, no. I just ahead, was going to say it, it was an honor, uh, Tony and uh, oh, Cam, to be on this debate with you. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I apologize if I came across um, harsh in any way, but I really enjoyed uh, speaking with both of you. Respect both of you, Marlon. Many thanks again to you for uh, your podcast here, for inviting us on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I, I would say and, likewise. And, I think you guys, go on. Go, yeah, go ahead, Cam. No, I was just going to say I think you guys are Christian gentlemen. I think that you guys have uh, you know been extremely uh, thoughtful throughout this process. And I, I, I told Luther going into this debate, I did not try to frame this as a debate uh, between you know uh, someone who wasn't a brother in Christ, right? I you know I you know look upon them and I see their character and I think they're they're great men, you know, and I. I uh, pray that Father Jonathan's ministry, you know, uh, leads many people to Christ. And, you know, thank you. Amen. amen. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for your thanks for your kindness and extending us that olive branch. We we definitely do appreciate you guys, too. You know, you guys have been nothing but a class act. And forgive me if I if I if I ever got a little too extra of myself. But you guys you guys are great. Uh, Cam, love love some of your work that I've seen online as far as with uh you know, just your, your talks on Christology. Uh, Tony, I, I'm just getting to know you, but man, you both were great today. And um, and Marlon, thanks for having us on. It was a pleasure. And Father, thank you as usual. Thanks for defending the, the faith. Yeah, thank you guys so much. This was a wonderful opportunity. This is my first debate, so thank you for being patient with me. And I'm sorry too if I got a little heated at times. Uh, but you guys were wonderful. I mean, I just had such a blast just being able to eat guys are both very intelligent just bouncing off with you guys i'd love to just sit here and pick your brain for hours but i don't think my brain can go much longer uh <laughs> but yeah thank you again so much marlon uh your channel is awesome god bless you and your ministry and uh yeah just amen have a great night guys you too. All right, guys. Thank you once again, man. And uh, I like to send out gifts. Uh, Luther got a mug, so I think Cameron got a mug. All right. So look, you see, when you get your mug, that means you're a part of the family. You know what I mean? You're a part of. You're officially a part of the, the Gospel Truth family. Nah, not that mug, buddy. Not that mug. You gonna get the. You gonna get the official one. You get the official one, man. But I'll be reaching out to you guys to get the address. So I can send Tony and uh, Father Jonathan a, a gift from me to you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come on the gospel truth guys so uh you guys take care and god bless all right all right thank Bye, you everybody. Bye. all right guys another great one in the books two on twos are always fun they're always fun and they always last a long time <laughs>
I get off these 202 debates and I be so tired, man. I be so tired, but I'm nowhere near as tired as the debaters, man. I mean, can you imagine how daunting it is to prepare for a debate and you're, you're not preparing for one person, you're preparing for two people, you know? And so you gotta imagine the preparation that's required that goes into it. I mean, you're preparing for every possible rejection or refutation that you can encounter. And obviously there's no way you can refute them all, but uh, you're doing the best you can. So you can imagine how daunting, mentally daunting that can be. And so, um, there's a special appreciation uh, that I have for the guys that come on here, man, because it takes a lot to study. It takes a lot to prepare. And most of all, they're taking time away from their families. And so it's always great for these guys to come on and, and devote that time. And so uh, I thank you guys out there as well, audience, because you guys are really uh, showing up and. And I mean that in a sincere way. You guys are not only showing up as far as just being in the live chat and, and, and commenting and discussing the topic that's at hand, but you got to support the ministry. You know, um, a lot of times people are afraid to ask for help. You know, and they're, they're afraid to say, well, the church, you know, people, religious folks, you know, all they want is money, yada, yada, yada. Um, there's uh, obviously to support in the ministry, there's a, some financial support that's needed. And you ask anybody who's involved in church or any ministry, uh, that's a need. And for you guys to really come out and really uh, throw that support at me without me even asking for it, uh, you guys are really great. And I do appreciate you guys for that. And so um, I know there's a lot of questions out there that were that I, that wanted me to throw it at the guys. But uh, as always, the Super Chats do take priority. And so uh, I thank you guys for continuously supporting the ministry. Uh, not not only with the super chats, not only just showing up in a live chat, but also with the subscriptions and the likes and things like that. And um, a, a, a great part of what the God's Truth is doing is through you, you out there and what you guys are doing and supporting and being a vocal part of the family, the God's Truth family. And so um, that said, I am going to get out of here because I am pooped and tired. And so I'm going to go hang out with the wife. And uh, I'm sure all those, uh, who, I can't remember who's on the East Coast, but I'm sure all of them are tired, as I am too. And so I'm sure you guys are tired too, because y'all stayed up the whole time watching this debate. But so you go ahead and get some rest, because I am. And you, uh, hopefully you guys will be able to uh, tune in on the next episode of the Gospel Truth. It should be a good one. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Gospel of Matthew. Does it teach that Jesus is God? So should be a good one so hopefully you can join me on that episode all right and that said make sure you once again hit that subscribe button hit that, that bell so you can stay in the loop all right may god bless you and may god keep you going